The following is a presentation of Apologetics Press. Good evening, good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here to UNA. If I could have your attention, please. My name is Travis Hunt, and I'm serving as this year's student president at the University of North Alabama Christian Student Center. And it's with a great honor that we are hosting this event tonight. And we're so honored for your presence here with us this evening. Whether you're, you're here in the audience or you're one of the thousands watching online, Thank you for being a part of this um, huge event. Uh, at this time, I would like to take the time to introduce our moderator for the evening. Dr. Brent Olive is the department chair of the Chemistry and Industrial Hygiene Department, and he's also an associate professor here at UNA. He obtained his undergraduate degree from UNA, and he has a Master of Science in Public Health and Industrial Hygiene from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He also has a PhD in environmental health sciences, also from UAB. And so at this time, I'll give you Dr. Olive. Again, let me welcome everyone to the beautiful campus of the University of North Alabama. We're glad everyone came out tonight. Welcome to all those who are also watching on the live stream. Before we begin, please let me welcome and recognize just a few special guests that we have with us tonight. We have with us Dr. William Kale, president of the University of North Alabama and his wife, BJ. <laughs> Dan Hendricks, who serves as the UNA vice president for university advancement and his wife, Barbara. And also with us this evening, Dick Jordan, who serves as president of the Florence City Council, and his wife, Libby, who also serves on our board of trustees. As you can see on the screen behind me, the topic for tonight's debate is, the pain and suffering in the world indicate that the Christian God does not exist. We have with us this evening Dr. Bart Ehrman, who will be affirming that position, and Mr. Kyle Butt, who will be denying that. Let me briefly introduce these two speakers, and then we'll talk about the format of the debate, and then we will get started. Dr. Bart Ehrman comes to us from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He serves there as a distinguished professor, a James A. Gray distinguished professor. He has been there since 1988, having taught for four years before going to UNC at Rutgers University. While at UNC, he has served as both Director of Graduate Studies and also as the Chair of the Department of Religious Studies. He is a graduate of Wheaton College in Illinois. He earned his Master's of Divinity and PhD both at Princeton Theological Seminary. He has published extensively in the fields of New Testament and early Christianity having written or edited 24 books, numerous scholarly articles, and dozens of book reviews. Among his most recent books are an English-Greek edition of the Apostolic Fathers, an assessment of the newly discovered Gospel of Judas, and also four New York, best, New York Times bestsellers, including Jesus Interrupted, God's Problem, Misquoting Jesus, and the book Forged. Among his fields of expertise are the historical Jesus, the early Christian Apocrypha, the Apostolic Fathers, and the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. He is the father of two children, a daughter Kelly and son Derek, and he is married to Sarah Beckwith, who serves as a professor of English at Duke University, and they reside in Durham, North Carolina. Let's make Dr. Ehrman welcome to Florence, Alabama this evening.
Again, denying the position tonight is Mr. Kyle Butt. He graduated from Freed Hardman University where he earned a, a BA with a double major in Bible and communication and a Master of Arts in New Testament studies. He has worked as a Christian apologist for the last 13 years in the Bible, in the Bible department at Apologetics Press. He is the author or co-author of more than 25 books dealing with topics such as the existence of God, the inspiration of the Bible, the deity of Christ, and various other issues relating to Christian evidences. His books include Behold the Word of God, A Christian's Guide to Refuting Modern, Modern Atheism, Out with Doubt, Truth Be Told, Exposing the Myth of Evolution, and How Do You Know the Bible is from God? He has been in two debates previously defending the existence of God. He serves as editor of Discovery Magazine, which is a monthly children's periodical about scripture and science. And he is also the associate editor of Reason and Revelation, which is a monthly journal of Christian evidences. In addition, he has appeared in numerous video series, including Answering Atheism, Is the Bible from God, and Truth Be Told. He and his wife, Bethany, have been married for 13 years, and they have three children, Drew, Anna Claire, and Reed, and they all reside here in Florence. Let's make Mr. Butt welcome to see me. The format of the debate this evening will be as follows. We'll have opening statements from each gentleman, which will last for 20 minutes. We will begin with Mr. Kyle Butt and then Dr. Bart Ehrman. Following those 20-minute opening statements, there'll be a 12-minute rebuttal from Mr. Butt and then Mr. Dr. Ehrman. And then following that, there'll be a cross-examination where the debaters will be able to ask each other questions, and those will last for 15 minutes each. At the end of those three segments, we will have a 15-minute intermission. Cards are being passed around the audience. Following the intermission, we will take questions from the audience, but those will need to be turned in before the intermission. So if you would like to submit a question, please do so. Submit that to one of the ushers before the 15-minute intermission. Of course, when we come back from the intermission, we will have questions and answers uh, from the audience and from our debaters and we'll have two minute answers with each debater having one minute to respond. We will have time to take approximately six questions. Following the Q&A period there'll be a five minute closing statement from each of our debaters. My job will be to stay out of their way. I'll try to keep things on schedule. Um, I've told them I'll try to do so without being disruptive. I've got a, a little desk bell up here to try to warn them as they are approaching their time, uh, but we'll try to make sure that we're fair and equal and give both individuals the time that they deserve. We'll begin with Mr. Kyle Butt. Good evening. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. I'd like to thank those of you who are watching via internet. I'd like to thank the Christian Student Center of UNA. I'd like to thank Dr. Ehrman for his participation in this event. And most importantly, I'd like to thank God, the all-loving, all-powerful God whose existence I'll be defending this evening. Tonight, we are discussing the idea of suffering. This idea, Dr. Ehrman says, is the idea that caused him to lose his faith in the God of the Bible. He says that he looked around the world, saw the suffering that people experienced, experienced his own suffering, and came to the conclusion that the Christian God simply does not exist. And that's why he'll be affirming this evening the pain and suffering in this world indicates that the Christian God does not exist. I'll be showing that that simply is not the case. I'll be showing that the pain and suffering in this world, in fact, do not indicate that the Christian God does not exist. Now, when we're talking about this idea of suffering, there have been many different approaches. Some people have approached it with very insufficient, inaccurate results. In fact, they have said, uh, 
Suffering is something that happens in your mind. It's something that isn't real, it's illusory, and if you could just get your mind right, then you wouldn't be suffering and you wouldn't have pain. I think you and I both can understand that when we experience our own suffering and look around at the suffering of others, we realize that's not just something in our mind. You can't dismiss it like that. Now, other people have taken equally inaccurate views. I debated a man by the name of Dan Barker in 2009, and he says if you go into a children's hospital and see the pain and suffering those children experience, then you know God doesn't exist. Well, that's just simply not the case. I took him up on the challenge. I went into the children's hospital there in Columbia, South Carolina, and the first person who met me was a volunteer. I asked her what she was doing there. She said she felt like she needed to help as many other people as possible, and I asked her why. She bent down and showed me a bullet hole in the back of her head. She said several months prior to that, she had been sitting in her living room, and a stray bullet had come through her living room wall and had struck her in the head. She said that she should have died, but she attributed her living to providential interaction from the Lord, and she said that's why she felt like she should help other people as much as possible. I said, uh, the other volunteers in this particular children's hospital, would you say that they believe in God? And she said, oh, far and away, yes, most all of them do. You see, it's, it's simply not the case that if you were to go into any children's hospital, you would just come away somehow knowing that the Christian God does not exist. So what are we dealing with then tonight? Well, historically, the idea or the problem of suffering has been put like this. If there is an all-loving God, and that God is all-powerful, then why do we have suffering? You, you see, the idea is if God is all-loving, He wouldn't want us to suffer. If He's all-powerful, then He would have the ability to stop suffering, and yet there is suffering. Now, lots of times this has been presented as logical proof that the God of the Bible does not exist. In fact, there's an unbeliever by the name of J.L. Mackey who several years ago said, yes, this argument is so very strong that it logically disproves God's existence. He said, just like A is greater than B and B is greater than C, therefore A is greater than C, you can take these three ideas that there's an all-loving God who is all-powerful and that there is suffering and you can logically disprove God's existence. Now, that happened to be an epic failure. In fact, he had to come out several years later and say, no, you can't do that. In fact, let me read to you what he said. He said, and I quote, We can concede that the problem of evil does not after all show that the central doctrines of theism are logically inconsistent with one another. Now, Dr. Ehrman knows that this is the case. When we were writing emails back and forth about the proposition, I asked him, would you affirm the pain and suffering in this world proves that the Christian God does not exist? And he said, no, you can't do that. The pain and suffering in this world does not prove that the Christian God does not exist. Now, that came as a blow for unbelief because there are arguments that if logically valid and sound would prove that God, the Christian God, does exist. For instance, the moral argument. The moral um, argument says if there are objective moral values, then God exists. There are objective moral values, therefore God exists. Or the teleological argument, or the argument from design. It says that when you see complex functionality, there must be an intelligence behind it. The universe exhibits complex functionality, therefore there must be an intelligence behind it. Now don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that unbelief says, oh yes, those arguments logically prove that there's a God. What I am saying is that if they are valid and they are sound, they logically prove that there's a God. And that's a debate for another time and I could show that they are. But what I'm saying is the singular argument that has been used by unbelief in an attempt to disprove God's existence on almost all accounts now has been shown not to do that. It can be conceded and has been by the unbelievers that you just can't logically disprove God's existence. Well, so what are we dealing with here? Have we solved the problem? Well, no. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here tonight, would we? 
What are we dealing with then? Well, here's what we're dealing with. Instead of trying to logically disprove God's existence, unbelief now contends that while there might be a God, there's just too much suffering for us to believe that He exists. You see, we can't prove that He doesn't, unbelief contends, but it sure looks like to us that He doesn't. You see, it's not a logically sound argument. It's more of, a, of an emotional appeal. Now, let me show you how this emotional appeal is often presented. Dr. Ehrman often presents this particular appeal in his writing and in his debates by rattling off a series of statistics on suffering. I've taken these straight from his debates and writing, and here's how that goes often. In 1918, the influenza virus killed 30 million people. Are you saying that a loving God allowed that? Every five seconds a child dies of starvation. That's 700 an hour. Every one minute, 25 people die of diseases related to unclean drinking water. Every hour, 300 people die of malaria. In the mid-1980s, a mudslide in Colombia killed 30,000 people in one night. There are genocides in Bosnia and Rwanda in Darfur, the Holocaust, the killing fields of Cambodia, failed marriages, homelessness, poverty. If God acts in this world, why doesn't he? Are you saying that God is allowing this? A loving God? I don't believe it for a second. Now, that's generally how the appeal is made. You see, it's not an argument. He, he would just like you to agree with him on, on some gut emotional level. Now, let me show you why this tactic simply, it, it simply cannot work. Because if the pain and suffering in this world argue against God, then all of the good things in this world would have to be evidence for God's existence. You see, if we could then just rattle off a series of statistics like this, then we could establish God exists through the emotional appeal. What if we were to say every single day hundreds of millions of mothers kiss their children and tell them that they love them? Every day millions of older people are helped across the street by younger people who gain no survival advantage from the action. Every second 30 million grandparents hug their grandchildren or think about them fondly. Every single minute hundreds of millions of people all around the world eat good food, enjoy good strong friendships, have good family relationships, and you're telling me that this happened because we evolved from primordial slime over multiplied millions of years? I don't believe it for a second. You see, it's, it's an emotional appeal. Now, Dr. Ehrman understands the force of this, and, and let me tell you what I mean by that. In his book, God's Problem, he says, the problem I have is this. I have a fantastic I have such a fantastic life that I feel an overwhelming sense of gratitude for it. I'm fortunate beyond words, but I don't have anyone to express my gratitude to. This is a deep void inside of me, a void of wanting someone to thank, and I don't see any plausible way of filling it. You see, to say I'm thankful for something, without saying I'm thankful to someone is ultimately a meaningless exercise. And therefore, if such an emotional appeal were the way to arrive at the truth here, all we would need to show is Dr. Ehrman's fantastic life and his deep void of gratitude, and that would be the evidence we would need to show that a loving God does exist. Uh, so let's apply our minds to this idea. You see, when we do, we see that there are several reasons why disbelief in God simply cannot be the answer to the idea of suffering. Number one, disbelief in God is forced to deny that there's any justice and fairness objectively in this world. And number two, unbelief is forced to deny that there is an afterlife. Now, let, let's turn our attention to that first idea. The idea of justice and fairness. After looking at the suffering in this world, Dr. Ehrman said this, and I quote, I was at a point in my life where I was starting to have serious doubts about my faith because of my sense of fairness, of unfairness and injustice in the world. The problem of suffering. Uh, but hold on just a second. 
Where would a sense of unfairness and justice come from if we are evolved primordial slime here by chance processes over multiplied millions of years? You see, the concepts of fairness and justice in a godless world simply have no reference point. But you don't have to take my word for that. Let me read to you what Ansel Atkins wrote in the Humanist magazine. He said that the concepts of fairness and justice make no sense in nature. He said there are simply biological entities doing what they must do, wanting what they must want, and getting what they can get, living by hook or crook, and then dying. Humanity is part of this. In fact, he says, and I quote, and listen to me closely. This is not Kyle Butt's opinion. This is Ansel Adams, a, an atheist with a PhD from Emory. He says, the only way to find justice in nature would be to have it inserted by a creator God. And at some level, Dr. Ehrman absolutely understands this, and let me tell you why. In his Forster lecture in September of 2008, he said this, and I quote, Suffering comes because we live in a random, chaotic world, and sometimes we get in the way of it. Now, Dr. Ehrman and unbelief are, are stuck. They know that there really seem to be some things that are unfair and unjust, but they don't have any source to arrive at these concepts. So you see, they're, they're not actually saying some things are unfair or unjust. What they're saying is that if there was a loving God, these things would seem unfair or unjust. But since they deny God's existence, they're forced to say that concepts such as justice and fairness just simply have no objective meaning. Now, let me read to you what Richard Dawkins, the foremost atheist in the world right now, says. He says, and I quote, This universe that we observe has precisely the properties we would expect. If there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. And yet, and yet that's simply not true, is it? Humans do have a keen sense of justice and fairness. And that's the exact opposite of what you would expect in a godless world. There really is something wrong with this world because of the sin that was introduced and the pain and suffering that followed. But unbelief is forced to say that, you know, what suffering occurs, it's not unfair. It just happens. You see, when C.S. Lewis was struggling with atheism, he ran into this problem. He faced it head on. And here's what he said about it. He said, of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying that it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, then my argument against God collapsed too. For the argument depended on saying that the world really was unjust. Not just that it didn't happen to please my private fancy. You see, our ideas of justice and fairness demand the existence of God. Unbelief not arguing that the world's not fair. Unbelief is arguing that there's no such thing as fairness. Yet in our heart of hearts, we know, we know that it's the very concepts of fairness and justice that make us struggle with suffering. You see, if there really is something that's fair and if there really is something that's just, if those are objective values, objective values demand that God exist. Justice does exist. Therefore, God exists. Now, let's go to the second idea, and let's see why unbelief fails to understand suffering. Unbelief fails to understand suffering because it fails to understand the purpose of this life. You see, unbelief like that held by Dr. Ehrman says that this life is all that there is. So while you are here, you need to grab as much pleasure and enjoyment as you possibly can because there is no afterlife. In fact, he's often on record as saying things like this. This is taken directly from his debates and writing. He said that we should order unhealthy desserts. We should drink fine wine. We should grill steaks on the grill. We should watch basketball and drink micro-brewed beer. And we should try to help as many other people do the same as possible. Now, this approach only works, it only works if there is no afterlife. 
You see, if there is an afterlife, then the purpose of this world becomes something very different than trying to get as much pleasure as possible. The purpose then becomes to forge a character that can live with the Creator forever in the afterlife. You see, in light of an afterlife, drinking beer and single malt scotch seem rather shallow pursuits when compared to preparing for a life with the Creator. You see, a failure to grasp the real purpose of this life will certainly result in a failure to understand suffering. For instance, if you were to come into my kitchen and you were to go over to one of my shelves and pick up one of the green pears that are sitting there and you were to bite into it, you might come to me and say, Kyle, you've got a pear problem. And I would say, well, why do I have a pear problem? And you would say, well, I tried to bite into this pear and it's styrofoam. I can't eat it. This pear is useless. It's worthless. I would say, hold on just a second. I don't have a pear problem. You're misunderstanding the purpose of the pear. The purpose is for decoration, not for consumption. You see, when we are told there's a problem with suffering, it's because the purpose of this world is being misunderstood. Now, as we're looking at that, it's only in a world where there is no afterlife that suffering could be a problem for an all-loving, all-powerful God. If there is the possibility of a God, then there's certainly the possibility of an afterlife. And if there is an afterlife, then it could be just exactly like one first century sufferer said. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You see, is there a possibility that there's a God and thus an afterlife? Well, Dr. Ehrman has to admit that that's possible. In fact, he says, and I'm quoting, I think the universe is such an amazing, awe-inspiring place that at the very least it demands some humility. And I think the declaration that there can't be a God is anything but humility. That's why I continue to be an agnostic and not an atheist. So, Dr. Ehrman admits, there could be a God. And if there could be a God, then there certainly could be an afterlife. And if there could be an afterlife, then the problem of suffering is not a problem for the God of the Bible. And the Christian God does exist. Now, in light of an afterlife, answers to why God permits suffering would become much, much more clear. You see, it would make perfect sense that God would endow humans with the freedom to choose and that freedom to choose could allow them to choose either correctly or incorrectly and bring about suffering in their life. We could see how a world with natural laws would allow people to forge a character that would allow them to go into the afterlife. You see, in a world where you can hear I love you, you have to be able to hear I hate you. In a world where you hear I love you have to be able to hear I hate you. In a world where you can feel a warm embrace, you have to be able to feel a punch in the face. You see, a world with natural laws is exactly what we would expect in a world that is helping us prepare for the afterlife. Now, let me introduce you to a man by the name of Bob Sperlin. Bob Sperlin, his brother was murdered. His mother died of acute leukemia. He was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. He's been on his back for 20 years. He lost his daughter, Bethany, four days after his diagnosis. You see, Dr. Ehrman would look at his suffering and say, an all-loving, all-powerful God simply would not allow that. Bob Sperlin looks at his own suffering, and he says that Jesus Christ is the solution. It's preparing me for an afterlife. Bob Sperlin looks at his own suffering and says, it's made me stronger. It's prepared me for eternity. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Kyle, for that very stimulating and interesting uh, uh, position that you laid out for us. And thank you all for coming here. Uh, so just curious, I've never been in uh, northern Alabama before. Uh, how many of you are associated with the Church of Christ? <laughs> right, OK. So three of you didn't raise your hand. Uh, <laughs> how many of you consider yourselves evangelical Christians? Really interesting. huh? Okay, how many of you are here to see me get creamed? 
Right. So uh, it is a pleasure to be here with you, even though we have to be dealing with such an unpleasant topic. Uh, it is a painful topic. It is a topic that uh, none of us takes li likely be lightly because all of us suffer. Um, we will ultimately all die. Many of us will die in pain. We all know people who have suffered. We know about people who have suffered. Uh, and it is not a pleasant topic, but it's an incredibly important topic. It's a topic that we should not take lightly. It is one of the big questions that all of us have to confront. I am not going to try and convert you to my point of view. My sense is that Kyle very much wants you to agree with him. Uh, and I don't mind if you agree with him or not. Um, and I don't mind if you agree with me or not. This is too important of a topic for me to try and win a debate over. My goal here is not to win a debate. Uh, I love debating. Uh, I debate a lot uh, since I was in high school, uh, since I got married. Uh, <laughs> I debate a lot, uh, but this is not about winning a debate. Let me say that um, I started, well, no, let me, let me start saying, I know Kyle loves debate too, and the way I know Kyle loves debate is because of the strategy that he just employed. Uh, and just so you know what that is, uh, Kyle has heard me give this debate a number of times, and he's read my book on this topic, and what he has just done is cited everything I was going to say and shown why I was wrong. <laughs> That's a very nice strategy, and it's a strategy I can't employ because I don't know uh, Kyle or his work. But uh, I will not be deterred. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what I think, uh, and you know, maybe it'll sound more convincing from me than it sounded from him when he rebutted it. I started out as a Bible-believing Christian. Uh, I, uh, when I was in high school, I had a born-again experience and uh, committed my life to Christ as my Lord and Savior and considered myself at that time as, uh, as born again. After high school, um, I uh, went to Moody Bible Institute for my undergraduate education, uh, which I don't know if you know Moody Bible Institute, but it is a, a solid, extremely conservative evangelical school. Uh, we used to say Moody Bible Institute, where Bible is our middle name, <laughs> quite literally. Uh, after, uh, after Moody, I went to Wheaton College, which was Billy Graham's alma mater. Um, I eventually uh, went to Princeton Theological Seminary. I went there, uh, I was still an evangelical Christian at the time, but I went there because I wanted to study the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, and the world's expert in Greek manuscripts happened to teach at Princeton Theological Seminary. His name was Bruce Metzger. I wanted to study with him, and so I went there. While I was there, uh, I was the pastor of the Princeton Baptist Church for a year. Uh, preached every Sunday morning, and uh, went to hospital to visit people, to visit the sick. I did the regular pastoral duties that one uh, would do, led Bible studies and prayer groups and so on. While I was uh, in my PhD program at Princeton Theological Seminary, I started to teach at Rutgers University. At Rutgers, I mainly taught classes in the New Testament and the Old Testament, classes on the Apostle Paul, classes on the Gospel of John. I was asked one semester to teach a class that was already on the books uh, they wanted me to teach that was called The Problem of Suffering in the Biblical Traditions. I thought this would be a really uh, interesting and uh, important class to teach because I had long thought, even at that point in my life, that the authors of the Bible are all struggling with this question of why they're suffering. The authors of the Bible did not have easy answers. They would have objected to easy answers, many of them. You too should not accept easy answers. You should not accept answers that simply confirm what you already think. If you do that, then you're no longer thinking. You're simply accepting views that you've already been taught or that you've heard or that you've thought since you were young. This class on suffering was very important to me. 
I decided that uh, what I wanted to do was to look at the various views of suffering found in the Bible, because as it turns out, there's not a single view of why they're suffering. There are lots of different views. There are the prophets. The prophets of the Old Testament are quite insistent that the reason the people of God suffer is because God is punishing them for their sins. Let me read for you from one of the earliest prophets, the book of Amos, where God explains why it is the people of God have been suffering. It's because God has made them suffer. Amos chapter 4, verses 6 and following. I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places, yet you did not return to me, says the Lord. They strayed from God. God tried to get them to come back, and how did he do it? By creating a famine. So they would starve, and yet it didn't happen. They didn't return. I withheld the rain from you when there were still three months to the harvest, yet you did not return to me. So he caused a drought. That didn't do the job. I struck you with blight and mildew. I laid waste your gardens and your vineyards. The locusts devoured your fig trees and your olive trees, yet you did not return to me, says the Lord. He destroyed their crops. That didn't work. I sent among you a pestilence after the manner of Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword, and yet you did not return to me, says the Lord. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For Amos, the reason people suffer, the reason the people of God suffer, is because they've disobeyed God, and God is trying to get them to return by starving them, by creating drought, by bringing epidemics, by killing them. Well, that's an interesting view. Is that a view that you want to have? Is that the view that you want, that the reason your child died in a car accident because God was punishing you? That the reason that your parent died at such a young age of cancer was because God was punishing you? Really? There are other books of the Bible that have different points of view. There are some books, like the book of Daniel, that say, it's not God who's doing this to you. It's the forces of evil that are doing it to you. The devil and his minions are doing this to you. The demons are doing it to you. The powers that are in this world, the evil forces in this world are doing it to you. But it's not God. Daniel has a very different view from the view of the prophets. The book of Job has a lot to say about suffering. And part of the book of Job... God brags because Job is so righteous. The Satan figure says, well, he's just righteous because of everything he's got. Look, you've given him everything. God says, that's not why he's being righteous. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Prove it. And so God gives Satan the authority to take away everything Job has. He loses all of his cattle, all of his possessions, all of his children, in order to see whether he's faithful to God because of everything he has. God takes away the ten children of Job through Satan to see if Job will remain faithful. Job does remain faithful. God brags on him. Satan says it's because you haven't really heard him yet. No, that's not why. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Prove it. And so he inflicts Job with horrible suffering personally and physically, and Job still refuses to curse God. Testing is the reason for suffering in the book of Job. It's all a test. Is that what you want to think? Do you want to think that those five children starve to death? I'm sorry, that, that child starves to death every five seconds? A child every five seconds because God is testing somebody? Or he's punishing somebody? Another part of Job 
the poems of Job have a very different point of view. In the poems of Job, Job complains against God. And he says that he wants to present his case to God. He says, I'm righteous, and yet I'm suffering. His friends say, no, you must not be. You must be guilty. No, I'm righteous. No, you're not. Yes, I am. And he appeals to God to appear to him so he can declare his case. I am innocent. I have not done anything wrong. And God appears to him. And instead of God giving Job a chance to talk, Job says, who are you to question me? I am the Almighty. You are a peon. You have no right to question the Almighty. God wows him with his thunderous presence coming at him from the whirlwind, and Job is withered in the dirt, and he confesses, and he repents. But what does he repent of? He doesn't repent of his sins because he hadn't committed the sins. He repents that he asked God why it was happening. Is that the view that you want? That it's wrong even to ask why you're suffering? We don't have the right to ask God why this is happening to us? There are lots of explanations for why they're suffering in the Bible. Part of the reason I taught this class at Rutgers is because I wanted students to realize that it's a problem and that there are different explanations. The explanations that Kyle just gave are not the main explanations of any of the authors of the Bible. In fact, you can argue these explanations were very much tangential to any of the authors of the Bible. My students at Rutgers, when I was teaching this class, I have to admit, one of the biggest problems I had was getting them to see that there was a problem with suffering. <laughs> There's a problem. While this class was being taught, it was during one of the Ethiopian famines. You probably remember those famines back in the 1980s. In this particular famine, it was especially horrible. One out of eight people in Ethiopia died because of this famine. Was this God punishing them? Was it him testing them? What good does it test somebody if they die? Is it that he, he um, was trying to show them that they have no right to ask why they suffer? One out of eight died. What I had to do in this class was to bring in newspaper clippings from the newspaper and show them a woman who was dying of starvation with a child on her breast who wasn't getting any milk. They were both going to die. If you believe in God, this is a problem. You should not settle for simple answers, even if they're given to you by somebody who is a very convincing speaker and is very confident. You should think for yourself and try to figure out why you think there is such suffering in the world. Well, after I taught this class, um, I kept thinking about the topic, and I thought about it for another 20 years before I wrote my book that dealt with the issues in the class, the book that deals with the biblical views of suffering, a book that came out about five years ago or so, six years ago. During those intervening 20 years, I kept experiencing suffering, uh, either personally or seeing it firsthand, cancer taking away loved ones in the prime of life, teenage suicide, birth defects, failed marriages, a friend who had escaped the killing fields of Cambodia, homelessness, poverty, and I kept reading about suffering in the world, wars, genocides, in numerous places, Cambodia, Bosnia, Rwanda, Darfur, ethnic cleansings, the flu epidemic that Kyle wanted to write off, 30 million people died of the flu. More people died in America of the flu in 1918 than died in all the wars of the 20th century combined, of the flu. It wasn't because of their free will. I got to a point where none of the biblical answers or the traditional answers were satisfying to me. 
The answers may be satisfying to you. It may be enough to say to you, look, you have free will, so of course, you can use your free will to hurt people, and so people will be hurt when you exercise your free will, and that's why they're suffering. That may be satisfying to you. Um, it may be satisfying to you to think, well, okay, it's bad now, but I'm going to die and I'll have an afterlife, and so it'll be made right then. That may be enough for you. If it's enough for you, fine. I used to believe in a God who intervened in this world. When I was a Christian, that's the God that I believed in. The God of the Bible is a God who intervenes. He intervenes to circumvent free will, and he intervenes to overcome the laws of nature. God can do minor miracles, like making an iron axe head float on the water. God can do spectacular miracles, like parting the waters of an entire sea so that the children of Israel can walk through on dry ground while the entire Egyptian army is destroyed when the waters return. God can make the sun stand still in the sky for an entire day so Israel's army can win their battle. Making the earth stop rotating with no physical after effects recorded. God can intervene in nature. God's son in the Bible is born of a woman who has never had sex. As an adult, his son defies the law of nature at will. Walking on the water, calming the storm with a word, healing the sick, raising the dead, himself rising from the dead. The God of the Bible is bound to no natural law. He defies natural law whenever he wants to do good for his people. When people are suffering, the God of the Bible intervenes. He saves them from slavery in Egypt, and he saves their souls for eternity. God intervenes in the Bible. And so my question is, and has been now for a number of years, if the God of the Bible intervenes, why doesn't he intervene? The Holocaust killed six million Jews and five million others, homosexuals, Poles, various people, 11 million people. Does God intervene when people are suffering or not? There are genocides. There are terrorist attacks. God intervenes in the course of nature, in the Bible. But what about that child who dies every five seconds? What about those 25 people who die every minute because they have unclean water? What about those 300 people who die every hour from malaria? If God intervenes, why doesn't he intervene? I know many of you think that God does intervene regularly. For me, I have questions. Let me reaffirm, I am not intent on converting you to my point of view. But if you think that there are answers to why they're suffering, I want you to think more about it. And I want, to, I want you to question your answers, especially if you're given easy answers. Easy answers are almost certainly wrong. If you can explain the greatest problem that the human race has ever faced in 20 seconds or less, you're probably misexplaining it. I simply want you to think. I want you to realize that, in fact, the Bible is a complicated set of books with a number of different views of things, including, by the way, two books that explicitly deny that there's an afterlife, the book of Ecclesiastes and the book of Job. There are numerous views in the Bible, and there are numerous views that have developed since then, and the best thing we can do as human beings is try to figure it out for ourselves. Thank you very much.
Mr. Kyle Butt will have 12 minutes for rebuttal, and then Dr. Herman will have 12 minutes to respond to his comments. How many of you in here have ever suffered? Raise your hand, please. How many of you still believe in God? Oh, most all of you, I thought. Uh, the statement, you should not accept answers that confirm what you already think. That statement simply is not true. Suppose I were to say 2 plus 2 equals 4. Do you already think that? Sure. But then suppose I were to say, if you take 1 and you take 1 more, and you add 1 more to that and 1 more to that, how many do you have? Oh, 4. Oh, but that confirms what you already think, so you shouldn't accept that. And then if you were to use that type of reasoning, if you have come in here and you did not believe in a God because of the idea of suffering, then you shouldn't accept anything that Dr. Ehrman has said this evening. Now, I would totally agree with Dr. Ehrman in a couple of areas. Number one, I would certainly agree with one of his very first statements. Here's what he said. What Kyle has done is just quoted everything I've said and shown why I'm wrong. <laughs> totally agree with that. I would. Absolutely. The second thing that I would totally agree with Dr. Ehrman on is he said he did not come here to win a debate. Now, I think that if you listened to his statements, that you understand he wasn't making logical arguments. He simply said, well, if that's all right with you, then fine, you can, but I'm going to have this and, and I'm going... You see, that's just simply not a way to arrive at truth. And then he concludes by saying... If there is a simple answer, you shouldn't accept it. Do you understand that when he said, if you can give an answer that solves the problem of suffering in 20 seconds, it's most obviously wrong. What answer has the unbeliever given us to solve the problem of suffering? Now, I want you to count, see how many seconds this takes. There is no God. That's the answer we've been given. That's a simple answer that, that just is not correct. Now, let me move forward. And I want you to understand that I'm not attacking Dr. Ehrman in any way. Dr. Ehrman is as qualified and as credentialed and as prepared of an individual to debate this topic as anyone. He has literally written the book on it. You see, there are simply inconsistencies in the idea of unbelief. And so when a person adheres to this idea that there is no God, there are obviously going to be inconsistencies in that idea. Now, Dr. Ehrman is better than most people at covering those inconsistencies up, but they are still very much there. Let me show you what I mean by that. Dr. Ehrman made this statement. He said, the prophets say that you or the people in the Old Testament were suffering because they had done something wrong. He said, the prophets do not talk about innocent people suffering. Well, that's simply not the case. Let me, let me read read for you Isaiah chapter 57 verses 1 and 2. Isaiah, one of the primary prophets. The righteous perishes and no man takes it to heart. Merciful men are taken away while no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his own uprightness. In fact, Dr. Ehrman understands that the prophets have more than one view on this topic. Let me show you what has happened here. When you go to the Bible, and understand this, to make the philosophically sound case that the pain and suffering in this world do not indicate that the Christian God doesn't exist, you don't have to use the Bible. You don't have to. Now, you can because the Bible is, is logical, it provides sufficient answers, but you don't have to. You can make that case without the Bible. But he says the idea of free will, it just doesn't answer the problem of suffering. Well, let's see what he means by that. And the other day I read about a guy who walked into uh, an emergency room. He had an arrow stuck right through his eyeball. It was out the back of his skull. He had tried to pull it out. The emergency medical people wouldn't let him. If he did, it was going to kill him. It, it barely missed an artery that would have killed him by one millimeter. Now they asked him why he had an arrow stuck through his eyeball. And he said, well, me, me and my buddies were out drinking, and we decided that my buddy told me to, to put a beer can on top of my head. He'd shoot it off with a bow and arrow. Now, the guy lost his eyesight in his right eye. Whose fault is that? 
Are you going to blame God for the loss of that man's eyesight? No, certainly we understand that free will makes a lot of sense when we look at the suffering that we've experienced or the suffering that other people have experienced. In fact, Dr. Ehrman understands this completely. And here's a quote from him. He says, the free will argument can, of course, explain a good deal of the evil in the world around us from the Holocaust to the disaster of 9-11. He says, yes, you can explain, and this is a quote, what happened in Nazi Germany and in Stalin's Soviet Union or in the ancient worlds of Israel and Mesopotamia by claiming that humans used their freedom badly. Now, here's where you got to pay real close attention to what Dr. Ehrman does. He's been doing it now for about the past six years or so. He says, okay, free will answers a lot of suffering, but are you saying that a baby died in a tsunami because of someone's free will? No. No, we're not. Who, who is saying that? There might be some people out there that are saying that, but we're certainly not. We're saying that free will does answer a lot of suffering. Now, it's a good answer to much of the suffering that we see. And, listen, you and I both know that. We know that we have used our free will and it's brought suffering on us and on others. And Dr. Ehrman admits that. Now, let's move to the next idea, the idea of punishment. He says, hey... Uh, punishment, are you saying that's a sufficient answer to all of suffering? Nobody said that. What he's trying to say is that the Bible has to have one answer that answers every single instance of suffering. Whoever said that? If a, if a person takes a pressure cooker and turns it into a bomb and takes it to Boston and detonates it and kills three people and wounds another 264, is it legitimate to punish that person? Absolutely. When they get a 23-hour-a-day lockdown surveillance and they are suffering, why are they suffering? Because they are being punished. In fact, in the, Dan, in the Michael Brown debate that Dr. Ehrman had, he said, I'm a firm believer in punishment. In fact, if we didn't have punishment, we would sink into chaos. Is punishment a legitimate answer for some types of suffering? Absolutely, positively. No one can morally argue with that. Now, let's look at that next idea. Third, all of us know that some suffering can be redemptive. By redemptive, what I mean is you could produce a greater good by allowing someone to go through some type of suffering. Now, Dr. Ehrman knows this is the case. In fact, he says when he was in high school, he got hepatitis. He said he was a mediocre second baseman, but when he got hepatitis, it made him stay in and study for the debate that year. I think his, his team might have won the national championship in debate that year. And he said the hepatitis is what caused him to pursue his academic career. And now here's what he says. I can't describe how happy I am that I got hepatitis. Sometimes something good can come out of suffering. So could it be that God is allowing some suffering to bring about a greater good? Yes, but then Dr. Emerald said, well, hold on just a second. I don't see how a child dying in a tsunami could bring about a greater good. Well, we didn't say that that type of answer would apply to that particular instance of suffering. In fact, what I want you to see is that in all of Dr. Ehrman's writing and speaking, there's only one kind of suffering that he does not agree has been answered yet. And that's the suffering of an innocent person by a natural disaster. Now, here's what I mean. If there were a person who suffered and is innocent by a natural disaster, he says that has yet to be answered. Let me show you why that's the only one that he says is left. If it's suffering by a person who is not innocent, you could say, well, that's punishment for what that person has done. If it's suffering at the hand of some other person, you could say, well, that's free will, which Dr. Ehrman admits is a legitimate response. If the child lives, you could say that is suffering that is redemptive, it's there to produce a greater good. And Dr. Ehrman would have to admit that could be the case. Now, here's the irony of it. When you go to the Bible, you will see that Dr. Ehrman even admits, and I'll give you the quote, when discussing the answers to suffering that the Bible pre presents, he says, how does one explain the suffering of the righteous? For that another explanation needs to be used. For example, that all will be made right in the end. There it is. The final piece of the puzzle. You see, if there is an afterlife that can give us 
Not an easy explanation because there's still going to be hurt, there's still going to be sorrow, there's still going to be pain, but it can give us a legitimate explanation for why there is suffering in the world. That's why Isaiah says that the righteous suffer, yet no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil. What's he saying? Other than when an innocent person suffers, they go to an afterlife where all is made right. And there again, we would certainly have to agree with Dr. Ehrman when he says, if that is convincing to you, then you should accept that. That's right. In fact, when Dr. Ehrman says, if God intervenes in this world, why doesn't He? I want you to understand there again, it's not a logical argument. It's just a question. You know, you could simply say, uh, Dr. Ehrman claims to, uh, claims to want to help the homeless. In fact, Dr. Ehrman's given lots of money to help the homeless. But in his house in, in Durham, North Carolina, there are plenty of rooms every single night that simply have room for homeless people. If Dr. Ehrman really cares for the homeless, then he could let them sleep in those rooms every night. If he doesn't care for them, why doesn't, if he does care for them, why doesn't he let them sleep there? Which is not an argument. And all Dr. Ehrman would have to show is, hey look, there are very good reasons why I don't allow them to do that. And then he would just list several. It's not an argument, it's an emotional appeal. Now if you listened closely, you heard the answer. Is that one minute? You heard the answer in Dr. Ehrman's statement. He said, Jesus Christ intervened in this world to save people from what? Did you hear him say it? Their sins. You see, God's never intervened just so you can have a pleasurable existence for 75 or 80 years and then gone to sleep and never woken up. God's intervention has always been designed to formulate a character in you that can live through the afterlife. God's intervention is much more valuable and important than the transient making your belly full for a day or two. Jesus Christ fed 5,000, but they were going to hunger again. But that's why He said, I am the bread of life. Because God's intervention is for eternity. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is getting lively. The, uh, I do a lot of these debates, and the hard thing is always that um, there are so many points that you want to raise and to object to, uh, and uh, it, it's difficult, especially doing these kinds of responses. So I pretty, very much appreciate uh, Kyle's uh, very coherent uh, and, and uh, compelling response. Um, it wasn't completely compelling to me. Uh, and either was his original presentation, which is what I want to talk about first. I was interested that Kyle uh, began talking about this woman who um, was in this uh, nursing, I mean in this uh, children's hospital, who had a bullet in her head. Um, and uh, that, um, you know, it did make her lose her faith in God in some ways. It improved her faith in God. When he was giving that analogy, suddenly what crept into my mind was this, this scene that we see all the time on television where there's a, an airplane wreck and uh, half the people in the airplane are killed and they're talking to a survivor and the survivor says, I just thank God that he spared my life. And you wonder, what exactly is this person thinking? That God intervened for him, but not for the hundreds of people who got killed? Really? You want, you're, you're that important that God saved you and not someone else? Um, yes. Many people suffer, and their faith sees them through their suffering, and sometimes their suffering strengthens their faith. If you're in that position, uh, I've got nothing to object to. I know Kyle finds that offensive because he thinks it's not logical. 
and that what we need to do is be pressing logic. We need to have logic. We need logical explanations. Everything has to be logical. You can't have an emotional appeal. We need to have the logical answers. I'd be happy to debate Kyle on logic. But the problem of suffering cannot be solved like a mathematical equation. It's not whether 2 plus 2 equals 4 or not. It's your life and the lives of your loved ones, the lives of people around you, the lives of the people in our world. It isn't a matter of logic and math. It's a matter of figuring out how to make sense of it all. I was interested in Kyle's initial point uh, during his presentation uh, when, he, when he stated that somewhat to his surprise, I did not want to argue that suffering proved God didn't exist. I'd say more than surprised, Kyle in fact was disappointed because that's something he could really go for. He could show you can't prove it. And I didn't want to argue that you can prove it because I don't think you can prove it. We're not talking about proof. We're trying to figure out how to make sense of this world that we live in. How do you explain it? The issue is not proof. The issue is explanation. The reason emotional appeals matter is because we are not simply computers with logical workings inside our head. We are human beings. And we should, do not, we should not deny our humanity. If suffering is not an emotional issue for you, I have nothing to say to you. If it's not an emotional issue for Kyle, I've got nothing to say to him. Because it is an emotional issue and we should treat it as such. Kyle wanted to go through a uh, list of reasons for suffering. Sometimes it's punishment, but not always punishment. Okay, so sometimes God is punishing people. So Kyle thinks that sometimes God does starve people to death, as Amos says. Is that what you think too? Or that God causes the droughts? Or that God causes the wars? God causes our soldiers to be killed in Afghanistan. God caused Vietnam to teach us a lesson. I can't prove to you that that's wrong, but it doesn't resonate with me. I really hope that's not what you think. At the end of the day, Kyle wants to, to appeal to the afterlife as the explanation for why they're suffering. It's an interesting idea. What Kyle doesn't point out is that throughout history, the majority of people in the majority of places have not believed in an afterlife, including much of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, some authors do believe in a shadowy place called Sheol. It's not a place of punishment for your sins. And it's not a place of reward for your righteousness. It's just a place that people go when they die and they just kind of exist there. There are other authors who have a different point of view, including, as I pointed out before, the authors of Ecclesiastes and Job. Ecclesiastes is my favorite book in the Bible. Ecclesiastes says that life doesn't make sense. I don't think Kyle would like that. But for Ecclesiastes, life doesn't make sense. It comes and it goes and it's hard to figure out the meaning. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Vanity in the book of Ecclesiastes refers to the mist that's over the ground for a little while that the sun burns off. It's here for a while, then it's gone. And that's what life is. It's here, and it's gone. What does Ecclesiastes think about the afterlife? Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 4 and following. 
Whoever is joined with all the living has hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. The living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no more reward, and even the memory of them is lost. Now, you can easily go to other per passages of the Bible that affirm that there is an afterlife. And you say, well, so Ecclesiastes didn't really mean it. Well, the author of Ecclesiastes didn't know that those other authors were going to be writing their books. This author doesn't believe that there's an afterlife. Either does the author of Job. As waters fail from a lake and a river wastes away and dries up, so mortals lie down and do not rise again. Until the heavens are no more, they will not awake or be roused out of their sleep. I myself no longer believe in an afterlife. Of course, for years I believed in an afterlife, and I believed pretty much what Kyle thought, that the suffering now is going to be taken care of then. What is right now, what is wrong now will be made right then. Injustice will be taken care of then. I simply don't believe it anymore. I think when we die, that's the end of the story. I know most of you don't think that and aren't going to think that. I came to think that for a lot of reasons. One has to do with the physiology of our brains. If somebody does a brain operation on you, your personality changes. Well, what's your real personality then? It depends on the makeup of your brain. When your nervous system no longer exists, you can't feel anything. You can change who you are. You can take away every memory that you've ever had by operating on the brain. We are our bodies, in my opinion. You might think that it's depressing that, in fact, this life is all there is. In fact, I didn't want to become an agnostic because I thought there'd be nothing to live for. That is absolutely wrong, as it turns out. Since this life is all there is, I relish this life more than ever. This is a precious existence we have, and we should love it as long as we have it. We should enjoy life as long as we can. But to enjoy life as much as we can, if we are human, it means helping others who can't enjoy life. During the time of this debate, there will be over 1,400 children who die of starvation. We have to help them more. During this debate, there will be 600 people in the world who die of malaria. We have to help them more. Throughout the world, there are a billion people who don't have clean water. Every day, 4,000 people die from diseases from not having clean water. We need to help the suffering more. There are natural disasters. Mudslides that kill 30,000 people overnight. Tsunamis that kill 300,000 people in one blow. We have to help people more. Here's what I would like. Kyle and I are not going to agree on whether the problem of suffering calls into question the existence of God. I think yes, he thinks no. Most of you are on his side. But how about we agree on one thing? That whatever we think about the existence of God and whether we can come up with answers for why they're suffering or not, whether we come up with explanations for suffering or not, whether we're satisfied with the explanation for suffering or not, can we all agree that no matter what our view about that is, we will do more to help those who are in need? Thank you.
We will now have a period of cross-examination where both debaters will be at the microphones. We'll begin with Dr. Ehrman. He'll have 15 minutes to ask questions, and then Mr. Kyle will have 15 minutes to ask questions as well. Okay, I'm not sure how this is supposed to work, so I think I'll just ask some questions that occurred to my mind. So, um, Kyle, my first thing is, um, you, uh, you pointed out that, uh, that some philosophers have said that, there are, uh, that there's a problem with suffering because, and, and it works kind of like a logical syllog syllogism, that there are three statements that, that people want to affirm, and yet when you affirm them, there seems to be a, a contradiction somewhere in there. It se seems to be anyway, which is that God is all-powerful, so he's able to do anything that he wants. Uh, which I, I assume people, when they say that, they don't literally mean he can do anything he wants. He can't make a triangle four-sided. I mean, there, there are some things you can't do. But, 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 but okay, with, with limited, except for nonsense, God can do anything he wants. Second, God is loving, so he really doesn't want people to be in pain and misery. And third, there is suffering. People are in pain and misery. So that, that's, some people have presented that as a logical uh, problem. And... Uh, you pointed out that, um, that now somebody who used to say that's a proof that God doesn't exist no longer thinks it is a proof that God doesn't exist. Do you know anybody who says that, in fact, that proves God doesn't exist? And if so, uh, who, who, who says that, and why do they say that? Okay, great question. Uh, the reason, I think I'll, ask your, or I'll answer your last question first. The reason they would say that is because unbelievers... I feel, have been looking for complementary evidence for their disbelief in God to the evidence that we have for God's existence. So when we present logically sound valid arguments like the moral argument that says if objective moral values exist, then God exists, objective moral values exist, therefore God exists. I think the unbelieving community recognizes the force of that and says, now we want one of those. And so a man by the name of J.L. Mackey, he was one of the foremost atheists in the 70s, 80s. He put forth this idea that the problem of suffering logically proves that God does not exist. In fact, I think William Rowe also tagged along with him. But then, a man by the name of Thomas B. Warren, who wrote his doctoral dissertation at Vanderbilt University, came forward and said, hold on just a second, uh, Dr. Mackey. Uh, isn't it true that there are some presumed premises in your statements that you can't really validate and it shows that this is not a logical problem? Isn't it true that, number one, like you said, one of the presumed premises is that a loving, all-powerful God when we say all-powerful, we don't mean that God could do anything that, that we would say just exactly like you said. He can't make a, a square triangle. God cannot lie. He can't do things that would violate his nature. And so when Dr. Warren pointed those out to Dr. Mackey, he had to come forth and say, oh, you know what? Yeah, there are hidden premises in there. And so you're right this logical problem, supposed logical problem, does not prove logically that your God doesn't exist. Now, he went on to say, I don't believe he does, and I'm going to try to change the issue, but logically it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, so that's my question, though. I mean, who does say that logically it proves that God doesn't exist? J.L. Mackey was one. Well, he's the one who changed his mind? You're right. What's up? Okay, so no one else that you know of? No, absolutely not. They, no, can't, they can't say it no. anymore. I mean, it's a specious argument because that's not an argument anybody makes. That's my point. Uh, I don't know unbelievers who say God must not, cannot exist logically because of the problem of suffering. And so when you, when you attack that argument, I don't know what you're attacking because that's not an argument people use. Have you ever heard of J.L. Mackey? Yes, I have. What's it got to do? I'm talking about today in the 21st century. Okay, what I was saying is... And you don't seem to know anybody who makes that argument. So I don't know why you're arguing against it. Well, I'm not. What I'm showing is that it's not a logical problem for God, and unbelievers trying to make it one, and they just simply couldn't. But you just said that nobody does. Because we disproved it. <laughs> we did. Okay. And, 
and just so I have I okay. I I associate with unbelievers, and I've never heard anybody make that claim. And apparently you haven't either, because you have one example from what was it, the 1970s? You haven't heard anybody make it now. Because so they let can't. me ask another question and get on to something else. You 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 make a lot of argument about um, uh, what you call the moral argument that that since there's justice, there has to be some kind of moral absolute for there to be justice. Am I saying that correctly? Is that how you put that? Uh, I would just state it like this. Uh, if objective moral values exist, then God exists. Objective okay. moral values do exist, therefore right. God exists. So you think objective moral values exist? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. One how would be justice. How, how much cultural anthropology have you studied? Uh, not much. Right. I figured that out because Cultural anthropologists object rather strenuously to the idea that there are moral absolutes because different societies are absolutely committed to different moral values. What do you do about that? Okay, I would just simply say that just because some people disagree about what you would call moral values doesn't mean that there are not some objective moral values. For instance, when you say, I looked around and I saw things that were unfair. When you say unfair, what do you mean? My point is that what I say is unfair is different from what somebody uh, thinks is unfair in a different society. Let me give you an example. There are, uh, there are societies that believe in blood vengeance, who believe that if your relative is murdered by somebody, the right thing to do is to murder the murderer. Do you agree with that moral judgment? I would say that God, from his nature, has issued certain uh, prerogatives to people. For instance, in Romans chapter 13, the Bible says that governments have the right to implement laws that are in accordance with God's nature that would punish a person who does something wrong. So yes, if a person takes a uh, pressure cooker and detonates it at the Boston Marathon and kills three people and wounds another 264, I believe that God has empowered our government to assess the nature of that crime and then say yes, that person could legitimately be sentenced to uh, capital punishment, yeah, and that would be legitimate. Right. That's not what I'm talking about, though. I'm talking about societies where blood vengeance is the right thing to do. If you murder my brother, then it is the right thing for me to do to murder you. Do you think that that is a moral absolute? No. Not so unless the moral you are absolutes are the ones that you happen to agree with? No, certainly not. In fact... You mean there are some that you don't agree with? I would say there are some in other cultures, people who, for instance, if a person said it's moral for three men to marry one woman or for three women to marry one man, uh -huh. I would say, number one, where are you getting that? And they would just simply have to say, well, they're making that up really? out of their what subjective. What if they said that's what Abraham did? Okay, if I were to look at that, I would simply say, number one, Abraham also lied about numerous things, and God doesn't, doesn't uh, condone that. Abraham did numerous things that God doesn't condone. So if we were to say if that's what Abraham did, just because Abraham didn't doesn't make it right. Does God condemn it? God certainly does condemn Abraham's lying, and God condemns Does he condemn his things. polygamy? You never read that he condemns his polygamy, but that was certainly under a system that he never says he condones it. And so just because you doesn't, don't read that God condemns something doesn't mean that he condones it. For instance, when God says, uh, if a person slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. In that instance, God doesn't condemn the person who's slapping you on the cheek. Now just because he doesn't say right there, I don't condemn that, doesn't mean he condones it. So absence of a statement from God in a certain instance certainly doesn't mean that he condones a practice. Right. Um, okay. I think um, 
Okay, let's just move on. We're not going to see eye to eye. The reality is that the patriarchs in the Hebrew Bible behave in ways that later are condemned by God, but they're never condemned for the patriarchs to do them. So uh, there's a reason for that. And it's a reason that you would know about if you would study cultures more broadly. Our problem is we're used to our society. And we think that our society has the right moral values when it comes to what's really right and what's really wrong. So monogamy is really right. I, I happen to be a firm believer in monogamy. But there are other cultures that don't believe in monogamy. So where do you find the moral absolute? Is it, does it just happen to reside in America? There are societies that believe in blood vengeance. Well, is that right or wrong? If it's right or wrong, why does one society get it right and the other wrong? Is it that the Americans are the ones who get these things right? So uh, that would take us all night. Uh, um, let me just uh, make one statement on that. Uh, there's a, an atheist by the name of Michael Ruse who says that the man who says that it's right to torture and rape five-year-olds is just as wrong as the man who says two plus two equals five. And it seems to me that if, if you guys are listening and paying very close attention to what he's saying here, he's saying that if you have a, an idea in a certain, a certain culture that something's all right, then another culture can't say that there's anything wrong with that. You've got your culture, we've got our culture, and yet that's exactly what the world did to Nazi Germany at the Nuremberg trials. They put the leaders of the, the Germans on trial, and the Germans said, we weren't doing anything wrong. According to our culture, we needed to exterminate the Jews. It was our law to exterminate the Jews. It was helping Germany. And Robert Jackson, who was the, what, uh, the Attorney General for the United States of America, said, no, they have violated a higher law than the regional law of Germany. Now, where do you get a higher law than a cultural law? That's exactly what we're dealing with here. See, Dr. Ehrman says there's no higher law. No, and that's wrong. Have you, heard, have you heard me say that? Yes. yes. What when? you said was... When did I say that? You said in some cultures, some things are morally right. In other cultures, other things are. So you can't say one of those is right and wrong. I'm asking you whether you think that there are moral absolutes and where you find them other than in your own mind. Where do you find them? Sure. The moral absolutes stem from the nature of God. It's the nature of God to punish people by killing them. In okay, the, let me, let me in respond. The Bible, in the Bible, the nature of God is to punish people by killing them, or starving them, or bringing drought against them, or bringing uh, epidemics against them. That's the nature of God. So what exactly do you draw from that for moral absolutes? Well, as you're looking at that, uh, if you were to say, okay, it's immoral for God to kill a person. Well, if God is the creator and he's all-knowing, then God certainly understands that if a person has committed something that's worthy of death, then yes, certainly they could be killed. Now, when you say, what do I come away with from statements like uh, God starves a person or God kills a person, if I were to look at societies today and say, is it ever morally right to kill a person? Well, the answer to that from the bulk of jurisprudence is that if a person commits a crime that is of such a nature that it deserves to be punished by death, then yes, it would okay. be morally is right. Is it right to, to starve somebody to death? Well, if you are looking from God's perspective and there is an afterlife, then a time period on this earth of something happening has to be viewed in the afterlife. For instance... No, I mean, I'm asking, do you think it's right for you to starve somebody to death? Okay, no, certainly. I haven't been given that prerogative by the Creator. But it's in the nature of God, you said. No, no, I said... Your no, moral no, rights are given to you by God. This is what God does, and so why isn't it right for us to do it? Okay, perfect. Now, that's where you've got to make a distinction. Watch the distinction here. If you say that it's right for an authority figure to do something, 
That doesn't give everyone the right to do that. But so you, said say, you're, you said your moral absolutes come from the nature of God. That's now, right. They either do or they don't. No, they certainly do. Now, watch this. If we say a society has a government that has a right to chain up a person and put them in prison for life, okay, if we say that, then would we draw from that Okay, you as an individual have the right to chain up a person in your okay, basement. Okay, do governments have the right to starve people to death as punishment? Governments have the right to put people to death. Do they have the right to starve people to death? Well, if it was a... Watch this. Let me, let me go back to what I was about to say on that. Uh, if you view it in... If you, if you take it in view of the afterlife, then starving a person to death for a brief time here is A not, brief time? You starve them to death, they're dead. Okay, now, watch that. Watch the thought. You starve them to death, they're dead where? Okay, Here. so you're but saying it is okay to starve people to death because it's only a short while. After all, it only takes about 20 days. So that's okay because they have eternity. Is that what you're saying? Okay, now. Is it you, what you're saying? Are you saying that it would be all right to give Answer someone a question. shot? Answer my question. Is it? what you're saying. I'm saying that God has the prerogative to take a person's life. I'm asking yes. whether you have that prerogative or whether we as a society have the prerogative to do what God does, which is starve people to death. Yes or no? You do not have the prerogative to do what God does unless he has but God authorized gives you, you to do your that. moral absolutes. That's right, he does. Okay. All right. All right, uh, let me ask you here, in your book and various places, in fact, tonight I think you said, you say that you actually do hold a biblical view of suffering. And you say that that view is the view of Ecclesiastes. And in your debate with D'Souza, you say that the, the Dinesh D'Souza, you say that the biblical view of Ecclesiastes is that a lot of bad things happen, but a lot of good things do too, so enjoy your life while you're here. Eat, drink, and be merry. That's right. It right. says seven times in Ecclesiastes. Okay. Now, uh, par pardon me if this seems like a jump, but let me ask you this statement. In your book, God's Problem, you made this statement. Now, it seems like a jump, but listen closely if you don't mind. Whenever they were actually written, the books of the Pentateuch contain very ancient understandings of Israel's relationship to God, the only true God, the one who created the heavens and earth. Now, do you believe that the Israelite God is the only true God, the one who created the heavens and earth? Do I believe that? Mm -hmm. No, I was talking about what the authors of the Bible believed. Okay, but right here in this statement, you say, whenever they were actually written, the Pentateuch contained very ancient understanding of Israel's relationship to God, the only true God, the one who yeah, created the heavens. Yeah, that's their understanding. Okay, so you don't believe that? I'm an agnostic. Okay, right, of course you don't. Uh, now, I took that quote out of context on purpose. To show that without... No, it's not out of context. Actually, what you quoted is what I said. Their understanding is that this is the one God who created heavens and earth. It's right there in the quotation you read. Okay, well, I'll, just, but I'll read it again, but it says, uh, whenever they were actually written, the books of the Pentateuch contain very ancient understandings of Israel's relationship to God, the only true God. But Yeah, well, yeah, their understanding. It doesn't say their understanding. But anyway, that doesn't matter. Because... That's exactly what it says. Their understandings of God, the one who created heavens and earth. Okay. Well, that, that's not what the statement says, but watch this. Now, what, if, you if you have a Bible, it. would you turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 for me, if you don't mind? Uh, I don't need to. What, what do you want to know Ecclesiastes about? chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Would you read that you for me? You mean the conclusion of the book? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you know anything about the historical critical study of the book of Ecclesiastes? I do, but would you mind reading it? Can you explain what redaction is? I certainly know editing, but if you don't mind reading it. Now, the man told you that he has a biblical view, and his view is the view of Ecclesiastes. Now, I want you to listen to the end of the book of Ecclesiastes and see if you would agree with that assessment. Okay, so this is a setup. I mean, his whole uh, arguments, of course, have been setups because he, he doesn't want me to explain this. He simply wants me to read this. I'll read it, if you don't mind. No, let me explain it, okay. and then we'll read it. Well, let me read it, and then you can explain The book explain of Ecclesiastes... <laughs> Now, let me go ahead and read The book of Ecclesiastes is one of the more complicated books in the, in the Hebrew Bible because scholars for over a hundred years have recognized that in fact it went through multiple editions. 
including if you wouldn't a, mind, let me show including you a redactor who added an ending in order to change the meaning of the entire book. This is what the ending says. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for that is the whole duty of everyone. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Okay, now, uh, I, I knew that he would say, well, that's redaction. That's not really what the book says. So let me go over no, to... No, it is what the book says. It's what it says in its final redaction. Okay. So if that's what the book says, then he certainly doesn't have the view of Ecclesiastes. No, I do have the view of Ecclesiastes. Eat, well, drink, and enjoy to... life while you can, because it's only here for a fleeting bit. Okay, let me go to Ecclesiastes 11, verses 9 and following. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. Okay, but that's not There is the nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. This I saw is from the hand of God. Okay, so Eat, drink, and enjoy yourselves. Notice, if he gets to pick out any single verse that he wants to, this is repeated at the, seven times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, notice this verse right here in Ecclesiastes 7, 29. Truly, this only I have found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. Does that sound like Dr. Ehrman's view that he says is from the book of Ecclesiastes? It's certainly not. Vanity now, of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What do people gain from all the toil at which they toil under the sun? A generation comes, a generation goes, but the earth remains the same. The sun rises, the sun goes down, and hurries to the place where it rises. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they continue to flow. All things are wearisome. More than one can express. The eye is not satisfied with seeing or the ear with hearing. It's all vapid and it's all going away. We should enjoy it while we can, as he says seven times, eat, drink, and enjoy your life. Now, if you're noticing what he's doing, he's trying to burn time. And if he picks, <laughs> if he just gets to pick anything that he wants to, sure. That's the beginning of the book. And what's the end? The, yeah. The end. <laughs> now, let's go to this next question. Now, lots of times, uh, Dr. Ehrman wants to, at the end of his discussions, say, well, this is what we can agree on. Uh, let's just all agree to do more and help others. And certainly, we definitely need to help others. But I want you to see why Dr. Ehrman is in such a tight spot on this. Is this a question? It, it certainly is. Here you go. Uh, in your uh, Forster lecture in 2008, uh, a young lady came to the front of the podium, of, of the auditorium and she said why is it you don't want people to suffer do you remember what you responded to her uh, I don't even remember the lecture okay here's what you said you said why is it that I don't want people to suffer I don't know I'm made that way I don't have deep philosophical reasons for it it's just part of being humans humans evolved that way yes do you remember that no okay do you agree with that yes Okay, all right. Now, you say that humans evolved just so that they don't want people to suffer. Absolutely, that's what scientists tell us. Okay. They deny what science says, but that's what scientists tell us. Okay, now let me read a statement that you made in your Christmas Longings blog, 2013. Good grief, how much of my writings have you read? <laughs> Most of them. Are they really that good? Well, I was just thinking I have learned a lot more about suffering this last year, but if... Uh, <laughs> Let, let, me, let me do go ahead and read this to you. Here's what you say. You say, uh, most people, and I'm going to stress most here, in our society value themselves. Egotism, self-centeredness rule the day. Most people don't give a blank about the pressing problems of, of our world. Most are far more interested in how much money they can make. Now, your next statement on your blog 20, uh, in July 25th is, there is suffering because people are able to do nasty things when they want, and they often do them. Yes. Usually because it advances their own purposes. So now you said that 
I don't know. I don't have deep philosophical reasons why I don't want people to suffer. We're just, we just evolve that way. Now, if you were to ask, according to your statement, most people who value themselves and are egotistic and self-centered, if you said, why are you egotistic and self-centered and you don't mind that you're not helping people or you don't mind that you do nasty things often to others? And they say, I, I don't know. I don't have deep philosophical reasons for it. I just evolved that way. Would that be a sufficient answer? Well, it's kind of like asking, it's kind of like asking if Christians have moral absolutes and they know what is absolutely right to do, why is it they do so many wrong things? Does okay. moral absolutes make anybody more righteous, do you think? Okay, now, exactly. in this statement, I can give you a deep philosophical reason why people should be kind and help others. You I, can't, and that's the point. Oh, but I don't think it's a matter of philosophy. I think it's, about, it's a matter of, of social reasoning. It's about society. It's not about philosophy. This isn't a, I'm, I'm not giving philo philosophical proof. There are social reasons for us to behave the way we should behave. There so doesn't if a have person, to be right. a philosophical proof for it. Sure, so if a person says, if you say you shouldn't do that to someone else, and they say, well, that's just the way I evolved. I don't have a philosophical reason for it. Yes, I should. What do you tell them? I think that morality is something that we need to understand among ourselves and enforce among ourselves. I think that there are certain things that are wrong to do. It is wrong for you to beat your child. Now, if you say, well, unless you have moral absolutes, you have no reason to think that. Actually, I do have reason for think that. I think it's wrong. Yes, but you have no reasons to think that. Okay, well, what reason, I mean, what reason do I need to see somebody suffer and say, I don't want that? Well, it, it's, you certainly do need a reason because... I don't need a reason because I don't want it. I don't have a philosophical moral absolute that says beating children is wrong. It just, I know it's wrong, and so do you. And it's got nothing to do with your platonic ideas about moral absolutes. Okay, so if you testing, were testing. to go to a person and say this is wrong and they say I don't need a reason to say it's alright to uh, often do very nasty things to people I don't need a reason to show you that the testing strong survive one, two, three, I just testing, think it's the right thing and I don't have to give a reason you think that would be alright? My view is that you come up to them and say look there are moral absolutes and let me give you the philosophical mm -hmm. argument for that to show you there are moral absolutes and you're not going to be effective either you're not going to change that person from doing what they want to do because you think you have a philosophical argument. Okay, you, you might not be effective, but you would be correct. And so if that person continues to No, I think to you would be wrong, incorrect. Now notice this. I think you would be incorrect. Why do you think that? Because you don't have deep philosophical reasons for that. You just evolved that way? You think that without moral absolutes, you can't make statements of right and wrong. And you have said... That's true. I just don't think we should do this. That's right. There are things that I think we shouldn't do. We shouldn't starve our children to death to punish them. Okay, do you think we should drink It's not because there's some kind of platonic form up in the heavens that indicates what our moral ideas ought to be. Okay. It's not that there are absolutes. It's, it's that we know as people what, we, what is right and wrong for our fellow human beings. And yet, when he says we know as people, the Nazi Germans didn't know. The, the Nazi most Ger people... Do you no, really want to go into Nazi Germany and what the Nazi Germans believed? Watch this. Most people in our society value themselves. Egotism and self-centeredness rule the day. Do you disagree with that? Now he said, do we you as disagree people, with that? He said, we as people know what's right. Do you disagree that most people are egocentric? I certainly do not. Okay. So when he says, we, we as people know what's right, according to these most people, they are simply saying, hey, I can do what I want to a person. I evolved that way, and you can't tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. Now, let's move on and go to this next question. I certainly uh, can tell them they're wrong. 
I do all the time. Okay, do you think we should drink microbrew beer? No. You say you should. You, in fact, let me I don't think we you. should. I don't think it's a moral imperative. Okay, I mean, you, I think you're crazy if you don't. Okay. <laughs> so when Dr. Ehrman says, I think we should do this, or I think we should not do this, when he just said it's a moral imperative, he it's has not a just, moral imperative. I know, that's what you're saying. And up to this point, you have said there are no real moral imperatives. That's why it's not a moral imperative. Okay, now did you get that? He just said there are no moral imperatives. Just put that for the record. Next question. All right. In your uh, conclusion of most of your... Okay, let me go to this next question. In the Brown debate, you say, I am a firm believer in the punishment of the wicked. And you say, otherwise we would sink into, more, into chaos if we didn't punish the wicked. Do you still believe that? Yes. Okay. Uh, Is this related to suffering? Sure, here we go. If there were an all-knowing supernatural being, would it ever be moral for him to punish a person? I'm sorry, what? Just explain what this has to do with suffering. Okay, you know, that's a great question. In your book, God's Problem, How the Bible Fails to Deal with Our Most Important Question, Why We Suffer, you have a very long section on punishment. And so I am taking a section out of that book. You're and asking, would it, if, there's a, if there's a divine being, could he punish people just as the way I think? So hypothetically, if there's a divine being, yes, he, he could punish people. Okay, so you think that it would be morally acceptable for a God to punish some people? Um, I mean, it's, it's such a hypothetical question for me because I, I don't have the mind of God because I don't, I mean, I don't believe God exists. I think part of the problem is that you think you've got the mind of God, that you know what these moral absolutes are in God's mind. Okay. How do you know the mind of God? Sure, and there would only be one way to do that. You yourself are not an absolute. Okay. You, now let's, you are not an absolute. Would let you me answer your with question that? here. You asked me the question, how do I know the mind of God? There would only be one way. There's one way you can know the mind of Dr. Ehrman, if he tells you what he's thinking. There's one way you can know my mind, if I tell you what I'm thinking. There's only one way you could possibly know the mind of God. You follow my thought, I think? Yeah, let me if ask you this, though. Do you know what I'm thinking? What he's thinking. Do you know what I'm thinking? I do according to your writings, yeah. But maybe you don't know what I'm thinking. What am I thinking right now? You haven't told me, so I wouldn't know. Exactly. That's my point. Do you, think now, God has God told you, has, you think God has told you everything? Thank you. We're entering into our question and answer session. We appreciate those in the audience for submitting questions. We have time for about six, so we apologize if we were not able to get to your question, but we do have uh, six questions here to pose. The format will be, we'll ask a question of one debater who will have about two minutes to answer, and then in each case, the other person will have a minute uh, for rebuttal. And so we'll, we'll try to stay on time, but we'll try to let them answer the questions as well. So the first question is for Kyle. How can we be sure that the scriptures today have been accurately preserved? That's a great question. In fact, when you're studying the inspiration of the Bible, there are several questions that you have to ask the text that you have. You have to ask yourself, number one, does this text exhibit characteristics of a book that would be from God? And what I mean by that is you have to show that this book does things that are superhuman. It does things that simply could not be done by regular human authors. And so if I were to say what's the lines of what are the lines of reasoning that could show the inspiration of the Bible, I would simply say that the Bible contains accurate predictive prophecy. The Bible contains scientific foreknowledge. The Bible is accurate in its factual details and has not had to have a second edition, etc. Now, when we say how do we know that it's accurately been transmitted? Uh, this question is worthy of an entire debate because what Dr. Ehrman, I think, will probably say is, no, you can't say that it's actually been uh, 
brought to you from the original authors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what I think that you absolutely will be able to show is that the text that we have in front of us is the text that the original authors penned in 99% of the text that we have, in the very small percent of places where there are differences between a certain copy or another copy, the things with which it deals are very, very minor. Now, what Dr. Ehrman would say is, no, they're not minor. They're actually of very large significance to your faith. They're not. And that would be another debate for another time. If you were to read F.F. F. Bruce's book, The Canon, then you would see the lines of reasoning that show us, and I want you to, to listen to this closely, that show us that the book that you're holding right here, the, the Bible, is the most widely attested, most accurately translated book from ancient history of any book that we have. And so I would just simply say in order to answer that question, we'd have to go through quite a lot of showing, okay, here are all of the thousands of manuscript copies that we have, et cetera, and here's why you know this is this reading, et cetera. Yes, so uh, thank you. This is a great question, and um, let me just throw out a few num numbers. For the New Testament, we have um, over 5,500 surviving Greek manuscripts. These manuscripts that we have are far more than we have for, for any other author, which is great. The problem is these manuscripts all differ from one another. No two of these manuscripts is exactly alike. They're all different. Scholars don't know how many differences there are in the manuscripts. Some estimate there are 300,000 differences. Some estimate there are 400,000 differences. The reality is there are more differences in our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. We don't have the originals. We don't have the words that Mark or Peter or Paul wrote. We have copies of copies of copies, most of the copies hundreds of years later, all of them with differences. As a result, scholars disagree on hundreds of passages just in the New Testament about what it originally said. Second question, we'll go to you, Dr. Ehrman. You said that the theological view that Christ is a God who suffers alongside us and for us is a powerful theological view. You clearly have a level of respect for the Christian message. You have probably been asked this many times, but what would it take for you to come to Christianity? I, um, I want to stress that in none of my books and in none of my debates, uh, none of my public talks have I ever understood myself to be opposing Christianity. I'm not opposed to Christianity. Uh, I, uh, I think Christianity has done a world of good in the world, and I think it continues to do a world of good, especially Christians who really practice their faith and the teachings of Jesus that you should love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and so I am not an opponent of Christianity. I am opposed to certain forms of fundamentalism. Uh, fundamentalist Christianity that believes that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, I think is demonstrably false and demonstrably dangerous. I will never ever become a fundamentalist Christian. I leave open the question of what happens to me in the future. I think that a person needs to be open to what happens to them, to where they go in their life's journey. If you aren't open to where you're going to go in the future, then you're just going to be running in place. Uh, I believe that I will change, uh, and I hope that I change. Whether I come back to Christianity or not, uh, I, uh, I don't know if that'll happen, and I don't know what it would take, but it seems to me no more likely than that I would become um, some other religion, uh, Jewish, for example, uh, or, or other things. Sure, and I would uh, just go back to that statement that he said. The, he said that, you, that the Bible is demonstrably not inerrant and inspired. Well, that's just simply not correct. The Bible is not demonstrably 
not inerrant and inspired. The truth is you can demonstrate that it is. Uh, interesting quote from Dr. Ehrman, I think, in the history of the Bible, page 125, he says, We are in a better position to know that the words of the New Testament, what the words of the New Testament originally were than for most other books. And that certainly is true. Not only are we in a better position to know than for most other books, but we're in a better position to know than virtually every other book that's been written in ancient history because, as he said, we've got more manuscripts than any other book. Now, when you're looking at that idea of Jesus Christ coming to suffer with us, I want you to put a, put, put a mental note on that because that happens to be a very important concept in this idea of suffering. Question for you, Kyle. Why didn't the God of the Bible make earth similar to heaven where the beings possess free will, but they love God and they commune with Him? Well, that's a great question. When we look at what God did according to what He said, then we see that in the very beginning, that's exactly what God did. God gave humans free will in Adam and Eve in the Garden of of Gethsemane, in the Garden, rather, of Eden. Now, did they freely choose to disobey God, and because of that freedom to choose, were they ejected from the Garden? Yes. Now, here's what I think is very interesting. When you look at the idea of heaven, were the original beings in heaven given the same freedom to choose? It looks certainly like they were, and that's why Satan was cast out of heaven. Now, sometimes it's presented, well, if God can make a place like heaven where we will have free will, and if we die here and we're going to heaven after this life and we'll still have free will, but we won't sin, does that mean that somehow God can make us have free will but guarantee that we won't sin? Two things on that. Heaven is a place where people who have chosen to adopt God's will for their life are then ushered into an afterlife. So, when we look at heaven, it's a place where people who were on earth but have chosen to give up their will to God that they end up in heaven. As many people have said, heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. And it very easily could be that those people who attain heaven you still could have free will in heaven, but God knows that no one in heaven will choose to sin, and so His foreknowledge that He knows you will not choose to sin makes it where He can say, no one will sin in heaven. He doesn't force that choice, but He knows it, and so then He can accurately say, there will be no sin in heaven. I think this is an excellent question because some people argue that uh, people have to have free will because if they didn't have free will, they'd be programmed to be robots. And then, then who wants to be programmed as a robot? So they have to have free will. Since they have a free will, they're able then to violate God's will. What Kyle is saying is that it's going to be different in heaven because heaven is going to be populated by people who have chosen to do God's will. I find this completely unsatisfying. Christians today have chosen to do God's will, but they still sin. So surely in heaven they will still be able to sin by that very logic. Why would they not be able to sin in heaven if they're able to sin here? So maybe they don't have the same amount of free will in heaven, but is that what you really want to think? It seems to me that this is a problem that really is uh, very large for anyone who thinks that free will is the answer for why they're suffering. Okay. Our fourth question to you, Dr. Ehrman. Uh, it's a, I guess it's a lengthy question with many questions, but they're all around the same idea. So, if life is so precious, if I only get one chance at this, why should I help anyone? If I only live this one time with the purpose to experience as much pleasure as possible, why would I waste my time helping someone else? In fact, why should I care about anyone at all? Why not take what I want and do what I please? If this is the case, wouldn't people like Genghis Khan be the most successful humans ever? When I was debating uh, my faith and, and, try, and struggling with my faith and seeing whether I thought that it was reasonable, I wrestled with just this question. I thought, if I, if I give up my faith in God, won't I lose all my moral compass? 
Won't I, won't I just be left adrift living a self-centered, egocentric life where I just cram in every pleasure that I could and don't care about anybody else? I, I thought that was a real danger until I became an agnostic and I realized those fears were completely groundless. I have no temptation to live simply for myself in order to seek pleasure. And most agnostics don't either. You might think they would, but they don't. Why? Because we're human. We know what it means to be human, and we cherish the human. It's important for humans to live for one another. This is how we are, this is how we have evolved. I know Kyle doesn't believe in evolution, and he doesn't believe that I should have any moral judgments or any views of justice and oppression and so forth unless there are moral absolutes. But I can tell you that I don't have those moral absolutes, and I'm still every bit as moral as he is or as most human beings are. It's not because I have moral absolutes, it's because I'm a human being and this is what it means to be human. Okay, with all due respect, I think he missed the question. The question was, if a person wanted to say, hey, I think that getting the most that I can and taking it from others is the way to live, how can you tell me not to? What he said was, well, I just think that most agnostics and unbelievers just don't think that way. And yet, and yet when you read his writings, they're suffering because people are able to do nasty things when they want and they often do them usually because it advances their own purposes. Next quote, most people in our society value themselves. Egotism and self-centeredness rule the day. Most people don't care, uh, most don't give about the pressing problems of our world, etc. One more, I'm constantly amazed at how many people in our world don't respond at all or respond so very little to the suffering of fellow humans. You see, what he's saying is, we don't really have to have a moral absolute. We just really all should feel this way. And yet, in his writings and in his list of the suffering that goes on in this world, he recognizes we don't all feel this way. So what we're asking, really, ultimately, the question is, how can you say one way is correct and another way is not? And ultimately, Charles Darwin said it perfectly. He said, if a person doesn't believe in God or future rep retribution or reward, he can have, as far as I can see for his mode of operation, only to follow those instincts and impulses that seem best to him. Okay. Fifth question to Mr. Kyle Butt. Can the biblical author's views on suffering be brought into harmony? Why or why not? Well, that's a great question. In uh, an interview with David Ng, Dr. Ehrman on Focus 580 was asked by David, he said, uh, so are you saying that there is one answer to suffering? And he said, no. He said, in fact, there can't be just one answer to suffering. And that's exactly right. You see, the Bible doesn't say there's one answer to suffering. When it, isn't it ironic that the 66 books that we call the Bible happen to make a perfect philosophical and emotional case for the answer to suffering. Yes, free will answers much suffering like Dr. Ehrman said. Yes, punishment could be answer to some suffering. Yes, some suffering could be redemptive. Yes, there could be an afterlife. And every one of those answers happens to fit perfectly in the text that we have in the 66 books of the Bible. Yeah, I obviously have, uh, as you'll be surprised to hear, the opposite point of view. Um, I think that, in fact, uh, authors of the Bible have different understandings of why they're suffering. In some instances, it's, it's possible to reconcile what one author says with another, absolutely. Uh, if you want to say sometimes God punishes, sometimes it's a test, yes, you can reconcile some views. Other views you cannot reconcile. The apocalyptic view that it's the forces of evil that are punishing the people of God is at odds with the prophetic view that God is punishing the people of God. The apocalyptic view emerged out of the prophetic view. In terms of chronology, the prophetic view was first, and then Jewish thinkers became dissatisfied with that and developed the apocalyptic view, which stands at odds with it. 
Both views stand at odds with the view of the book of Job. Both the view that, that it's, it's uh, well, especially the view that you have no right to ask why you suffer. That's not a view most of the authors of the Bible have, so I don't think that they're reconcilable. Okay, last question. This is posed to you, Dr. Ehrman. Do you believe that evil can be objectively recognized as opposed to subjectively? If so, upon what is that answer based? I won't go into the question about whether there are such things as objectives. What I will say is that we cannot be objective in the sense that we would have any ability to recognize an objective absolute. The reason is because we are subjects. We have subjective views of things, whether we want to be objective or not. We are raised in certain ways, we're given certain perspectives and certain uh, worldviews, we're given certain religious beliefs that we inherit from the time that we're young. We have likes and dislikes and loves and hates. There are things we appreciate, things that we don't appreciate. There are things that we think are good and things that we think are bad. And all of these are different for all of us. Why is that? Why is it that we all have different likes and dislikes and loves and hates? Because we're subjects. Even if there were some kind of objective reality out there that is, in theory, the objective view of right and wrong, we wouldn't be able to access it because we don't have an objective way to get there. We can only use our subjectivity, even if we say that the answer is in the Bible. You have to read the Bible and you have certain interpretation of the Bible, and your interpretation of the Bible is different from someone else's interpretation of the Bible. Why is it that people who claim we have moral absolutes disagree with each other all the time? Why doesn't the absolute give them the absolute same answer? It's because we are subjective people. Thank you. I think that right there is the crux of the issue. Let me uh, read you a statement from Dr. Ehrman, there's something wrong with this world. Now is that an objective statement or a subjective statement? You see, the truth of the matter is we can objectively say there is something wrong with this world. And when I say that, what I mean is if there is a sense of justice and fairness and if this world were all that there is, and there is no afterlife, then yes, you could state there is something wrong with this world. And when he states that, he doesn't mean, well, I think there's something wrong with the world. Uh, if you don't, that's fine. He means, no, there really is something wrong with this world. And if that's true, if some things really do seem like they are unfair, then unbelief cannot be the answer. And so what he's trying to say there is, no, you can't really say something's wrong with this world. You can't really say there's anything that's just or fair. But that's not true. Some things are unjust. Some things are unfair. And knowing that proves that there is a God. Thank you again for the questions. We will move now to closing statements. We'll begin with Dr. Ehrman. Each uh, gentleman will have five minutes for their closing statement. Well, uh, thank you, Kyle. This has been a very stimulating debate. I hope you all have uh, enjoyed the back and forth uh, more than I have. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't like talking about this subject. Uh, I wrote my book on uh, the problem of suffering, and uh, for about a year after that, the only thing anybody ever wanted me to talk about was the problem of suffering. And uh, frankly, I, I find it uh, depressing. Um, I would rather try to deal with the problem of suffering than to try and talk about it. Uh, and um, so, uh, but here we are. I think it's important for us to talk about because, as I said at the outset, it's the most important uh, 
question that we have to deal with as human beings. Many people that I uh, have confronted and been confronted by after writing my book uh, have told me what the answer to suffering is. Um, several people during the intermission uh, told me what the answer to suffering is. Uh, they were able to tell me what the answer to the problem of suffering is in about 20 seconds or less. I, I object strenuously when Kyle says that my answer is there is no God and he gets a laugh. That's not my answer. I think it's a very complex matter for why there is suffering in the world and our responses to suffering ought to be equally complex. You, most of you, most of, not all of you, most of you are people of faith. You firmly believe in God. You firmly believe in Jesus Christ. You are committed to Christ and to living ways that reflect the life of Christ. If you believe in God, you think that he gave you your intelligence. What I ask is that you use your intelligence. I'm not asking that you simply accept everything that somebody says who happens to disagree with something you already thought. But I am asking you to think seriously about whether your answers to these questions are satisfying to you, whether they're really satisfying to you. When your child dies, are you satisfied with the, with the comfort you're given by the idea that she'll be in heaven to see you later? Is that satisfying for you? When you think about the thousands and millions of people in the world who are dying of starvation, are you satisfied that it's because of free will or because there's an afterlife and it'll be made right later? Are you satisfied with that? If you're satisfied, if you've thought about it and you're satisfied with it, fine. If you're not satisfied with it, think harder about other ways to figure it out. It is a horrible world we live in. Most people don't live the kind of lives that we are able to enjoy. I obviously don't know any of you personally, but you're here and you're wearing clothing, and I assume that you've got a home to go to, and that you probably have modern conveniences. You pro many, most of you have cars and televisions, and you've got some degree of luxury. When millions of people are starving to death in our world, millions of people are suffering because of natural disaster, millions of people are suffering from the ravages of war and drought and famine, an epidemic. It is very difficult indeed to come up with satisfactory answers whether you are a believer or not. My view of things is that at the end we may not come away with answers that are absolutely satisfying. This is a difference between Kyle and me. Kyle appears to think he has the answers. I have the questions and I don't find his answer satisfying. My view is that we should wrestle with the questions and wrestling with the questions is more important than coming away with easy answers. My other view is that in some instances we may just come away saying, I don't know. If you're a believer, that would be, it's all a mystery. If you're a non-believer, it would simply be, I don't know. At the end of the day, though, my view is that even though we can't always have an answer for why they're suffering, we can always have a response to suffering. Our response should be to help people who are in need as much as we can and as often as we can. If we don't do that, we're not being human. And if you're Christian, you're not being Christian. I hope all of us will be more human at any rate, and I hope those of you who are Christian will be more Christian 
and let us together try to solve the problems that are confronting our world as people suffer and die every day. Thank you very much. Sure appreciate all of you being here to consider this very important matter. I want to just go back over a few things that were done in this debate just so that they'll be in your mind here at the end. Uh, when we were talking about the things that are in Ecclesiastes and the things that are in other passages, Dr. Ehrman often says, well, one view contradicts another view, etc. But then when you go to the verse, he says, well, that verse wasn't really in the original writing. Uh, redactor put that in. Somebody edited that in. I think it's interesting that in his book, Did Jesus Exist?, he's talking about people who claim that Jesus never existed. And here's what he says. Here we find, again, textual studies driven by convenience. If a passage contradicts your view, simply claim that it was not actually written by the author. And I think that sometimes is very much what we see when he says, I hold the book of Ecclesi I hold the view of Ecclesiastes, and we go to the end of Ecclesiastes and we see the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. Well, I think we can see that the view of Ecclesiastes is not exactly what we were told by Dr. Ehrman. Now, as he concludes his discussion. Another thing that I think we need to, to carry away from this is, Dr. Ehrman made two statements that, that I think are very, very pertinent. Number one, he said, okay, Kyle wants you to think about this stuff, but isn't suffering an emotional issue? Well, certainly. It very, very much is an emotional issue. But shouldn't we also not only treat it as an emotional issue, but as an intellectual issue as well? Absolutely. When is the last time we heard unbelief say, you Christians are just, th are just thinking way too much about this? Well, sure, it's an emotional issue, but it's certainly an intellectual one as well. That's why a person would write an entire book about it. That's why he would be in four or five debates on the subject. It's something that needs to be discussed rationally. And when we do discuss it rationally, we saw several things. We saw that there are justifiable reasons why an all-loving, all-powerful God would allow suffering in this life. We saw that the idea of free will answers some of that. The idea of punishment could possibly answer some of that. The idea of redemptive suffering could certainly answer that. And we know of instances in each one of our lives where those things are the case. Now, after you deal with this intellectual idea of it, what do we have then with people who simply say, well, well, that doesn't matter, I'm still not going to believe in God. Now, Dr. Ehrman made a statement in his book, Does Jesus Exist? He says, anyone who chooses to believe something that's contrary to the evidence that an overwhelming majority of people find overwhelming, overwhelmingly convincing will not be convinced, simply will not be convinced. And you see, I think that's what we're dealing with here. It's not as if unbelief can say, well, here's the problem with God. They just simply say, well, well, I don't want to believe it. In fact, I think you heard those exact words almost from Dr. Ehrman tonight. Now, we all understand there's some suffering that no words can touch. What do you do about the deep suffering that words just simply are inadequate to deal with? I think it's interesting there again. I don't think you'll be surprised. I'm going to be quoting Dr. Ehrman here. He said, I think you do exactly what Job's friends did. When they came to Job, they sat with him and suffered with him. He said, I think that's exactly what you do. You suffer with people. Now, isn't it interesting that when we look into the Bible, we see someone suffering with us. You see, not only does the Bible give us logical answers to the idea of suffering, but it reaches down to the heart of it, to the emotionally wrenching issues of unspeakable suffering. And it says, oh, there's somebody who does suffer with you. You see, the answer to suffering in the Bible is not a logical syllogism. It's a man. 
It's God in the form of man coming to suffer with us. Jesus Christ. And so the next time we wonder, and there will be a next time, where is God when I suffer? That suffering that words can't touch. We should think He's exactly where He was when His Son hung on the cross and suffered with us. Thank you. The debate has just concluded between Bart Ehrman and Kyle Butt, and we are waiting backstage, and we're going to conduct interviews with both of these gentlemen in just a few minutes. But uh, while, we wait, while we are waiting for them, I wanted to offer just a word of explanation about the number of viewers that we had tonight tuning into GBN. In fact, uh, we understand that uh, there was some difficulty with some logging on to the GBN website, and that is because uh, the sheer number of people that tried to log on tonight just uh, overwhelmed our website. And uh, we got that uh, corrected after a little bit. We also found out there were some problems with uh, one of the Roku channels. And again, I think the same explanation. Uh, but that's encouraging to know how many people actually were trying to watch the debate tonight. And uh, we are very thankful for that. In just a moment, we're going to have uh, Dr. Ehrman out and we're going to ask him some questions, let him give us his feedback on the debate. Uh, but while we're waiting for that, uh, I want to ask, um, uh, Dr. Dave Miller some questions and get uh, his observations from the debate. Uh, Dave, there was a, an allusion made to free will in heaven. Dr. Ehrman was asking, uh, suggesting that Kyle had a contradiction saying that we have free will now, indicating God loves us, but in heaven that free will will be limited or taken away. Um, can you comment on that, address that? You know, that very point was brought, this is a standard atheistic tactic. It was brought up in the war and flu debate back in 1976. If, if we have free will in this life and can freely choose to do wrong, what would keep us from doing the same thing in heaven? I thought Brother Warren had the definitive answer and it's certainly a biblical concept. Uh, for one thing, we'll be in heaven, not earth. You know, earth is a realm in which we are subject to all kinds of temptations and very specifically, the fleshly body, which the 1 Corinthians 15 clearly states we will shed, we will have a new body, and therefore we're not going to be subject to the same temptations to which we are subject now. And then secondly, there's the idea that um, when you get to heaven, that is going to be such an accelerated existence that you and I cannot even grasp or fathom. The scripture has to use apocalyptic and figurative language to even convey the concept. Mm -hmm. So in such an accelerated existence, we're not going to be subject to the same form of temptation to which we're subject now. Uh, the, the beauties of heaven will be such that we will not even entertain. In fact, I, uh, wanting to leave or to sin, in fact, I suspect we will be overwhelmed by the presence of deity. Okay. They are telling me that uh, Dr. Ehrman is on his way, so momentarily, we will have him here with us to get his feedback and thoughts uh, how he thinks things went tonight. And uh, we're looking forward to that. I think he's here. He's here. He's okay. Here. here he is with us. Hi. Dr. Ehrman, Don Blackwell. Hey, Don. Hi, Dr. Ehrman. Dave Miller. Good hey, to Dave. see you. We appreciate very much you taking the time to let us ask you some follow-up questions after the debate, and uh, we appreciate uh, the gentlemanly manner in which you conducted yourself tonight. Thank you. I um, thought I would ask you um, at the start, was there anything that frustrated you with the debate tonight? You know, the most frustrating thing about debates is that when somebody, uh, when your opponent says something in the middle of a 10-minute speech or a 20-minute speech, and something about a three-minute mark, you really want to get in there because, wait a second, I want to object to that. <laughs> and so tonight was no different from any other debate. That's, that's, just, that's just how it is. That's the nature of the beast. I wondered about this. Um, Kyle cited a number of your writings, and he did that over and over. Yes. And uh, you made a comment uh, about that at one time. Uh, were you surprised uh, how much time he had spent in preparation or how much of your writings he had? Well, I thought it put him at an unfair advantage um, because, you know, he's combed over my writings to try and find internal inconsistencies and contradictions. And 
I, I could very easily explain every one of these, but the, that opportunity wasn't, wasn't really presented. So he never like said, it doesn't this contradict? And so then I could explain, well, you know, that, so, um, you know, I would have preferred actually uh, arguing issues um, rather than simply arguing about whether I contradicted myself someplace or other. Was there anything tonight that you would have done differently, maybe that uh, you were disappointed in your own performance? Um, I'm not sure I would have done anything much differently. I think the hardest thing with a debate like this is doing the rebuttal because um, it's, um, if you don't know what the other person's going to say, it's very hard to come up with a rebuttal uh, on the spot. And the problem is that Kyle knew exactly what I was going to say because I've done this debate five times and he's read my book on it. So, uh, so it's not difficult to come up with a rebuttal in that case, but it is very difficult on your, on your feet to come up with something. So uh, I think, I, but there's nothing to do about that. I mean, that's just the way, that's just the way it is. I'm asking you some human interest questions yeah. here and um, let me put you on the spot. Um, do you feel like Kyle did a good job as a debater? Uh, no, he's a terrific debater, absolutely a terrific debater, and he, he knows the strategy and he knows the audience, and those are the two main things. You, you obviously have to be rhetorically effective, which he is. Uh, he's a very good public speaker, and he knows uh, how to uh, address an audience that's favorable towards him. Uh, it, would have been, it would have been a very different debate with a different audience. Um, you know, I've, I've had this debate at Chapel Hill uh, where I teach, uh, where the audience wasn't c predominantly church people. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different debate in that setting. Right. Yeah. It's uh, interesting, you made a reference to uh, variation, textual variations, and hundreds of thousands of those, I believe you said, three to 400,000. Yeah. And this is kind of your area of expertise, right? Yeah. And uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Miller and I were discussing this. I think he had a question for you along I those lines. You. <clears throat> you went to Princeton and got to study under Dr. Metzger. Yes which I suppose you could say would be at least one of the foremost textual critics in the 20th century, I suppose. Would yeah, you say I top say 10, top 20? Oh, uh, top two. He um, spent so much of his life authenticating the integrity and authenticity of the, of the text and obviously believed, I, I presume, I've not looked in carefully to his religious views, but I presume that he believed uh, that that is the word of God. <clears throat> And he also spent a great deal of time, as you, you know, as you point out, saying there's 300,000, 400,000 textual variants in the 5,500 plus manuscripts. But as a textual critic, he did not believe that that implied that we could not know substantially the Word of God today. But from what I'm hearing you say in your other books, Jesus Interrupted in some of these other books, you have broken with that viewpoint. That's right. And that occurred in the the shift that you said the con that you took that, when that, you went to Rutgers? <clears throat> uh, that, that, that had nothing to do with my becoming an agnostic. Um, but it was a realization that I had fairly early on. Uh, but Bruce Metzger and I actually uh, both saw this as an academic question rather than a theological or religious question. Uh, he and I co-authored the, uh, the, uh, the new edition of his textbook on the manuscripts of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Uh, he asked for me to be his, his co-author. Uh, he read my book, Misquoting Jesus, and told me that he liked it very much. So uh, we, we actually agreed on academic issues, even though we had different religious perspectives. Did he believe, though, that the text, that, well, you know, Westcott and Hort, 999 one-thousandths of the New Testament text, we know to be reconstructed. We know that we have it. Um, I, you know, he probably on occasion did put percentages on it. You know, the problem is that when you come up with a statistic like that, it's impossible to verify. I mean, the, the value of a statistic is it gives you something verifiable. So suppose you said 99.5% of the New Testament is the original. Well, you don't know that unless you have the original to compare what we have against. If you had the original, you could take what we have and see, oh, it's 99.5% the same. Mm. But without the original, you, don't, you can't do that. Well, but taking the 5,500 plus and laying them side by side, you, can, you know whether or not you have the original. You just may not know which one it is on any given textual variant. But you are aware of the information that would be in either one. And then there's the issue that 
the vast majority of these really do not affect Absolutely. the Absolutely. No, they don't affect the, a lot the, As far as Christian doctrine is concerned. Well, as, yeah, as far as much of anything concerned. I mean, yeah. mo most of these differences show that scribes couldn't spell any better than my students can. <laughs> so uh, so uh, absolutely, I don't deny that. I've never denied that. I've always said that most of these differences are immaterial. Some of them are extremely important. Um, did, did, uh, did the Gospel of Luke think that Jesus' death was an atonement for sin? It depends on which variant you go with. Did John's Gospel think that Jesus was the unique God? It depends which textual variant you go with. I could go down a whole list of ones that really matter, and the reality is, this is just a, a statement of fact, experts in this field disagree on hundreds of places in the New Testament. So, um, but they disagree on these very point. In other words, you know, did it did it did it have the or did it have was? Well, they do agree, disagree on those, but they disagree on important places. So um, that's why we have textual scholarship still because we we haven't we haven't gotten back to the original. If we if we had the original, there wouldn't be no there'd be no need for textual scholarship. Well, isn't that that's really not textual, is it? Because if you have all these manuscripts, you can come to a conclusion. You can give your arguments as to why it would seem the original read this way. Isn't that really not the issue here? The issue is, does the New Testament teach the deity of Christ? And that's not really a textual that's uh, not variant a textual issue. issue. That's a theological issue right. or a hermeneutical issue. Right, but I've never, I mean, that isn't what we're talking about. We're talking about the text. We're not talking about the theology. We're talking about, do you know what the authors originally wrote? or not. Mm. I hate to uh, interrupt because this is such a great <laughs> discussion, we have another debate. <laughs> but we are limited on time that we're here tonight. We want to thank you so very much for My giving pleasure. us a few minutes of great. your time. You're welcome. Thank we you very much. Appreciate Enjoy it. I hope you have a good night. Great. Thanks. Thank you. We should in just a moment be uh, joined by Kyle Butt and we're going to talk to him about his assessment of the debate tonight. Hey, hey Kyle, guys. how are you? I'm doing great. Good to Don. see you. Outstanding hey. job. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much for taking a few minutes to talk to us. We know you've got to be exhausted after mm. the debate tonight. Uh, we want to no just... time off. No, no, <laughs> no, no time off. None at all. Get back to work. <laughs> well, tomorrow's a Saturday, so I was hoping to get to rest at least a day or two. <laughs> Well, we wanted to ask you a few questions that okay. are human interest questions. Sure. Uh, obviously, you spent a tremendous amount of time in preparation for this debate, as was obvious by the number of quotations that you made. Uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Ehrman seemed quite taken back by the amount of preparation. Can you t talk to us about that? Uh, sure, and I'll, I'll tell you why I do that. It's, it's one thing to stand up and say, this is the position, this is correct, and here's why. But unbelief is not a rational, logical position. And I don't mean that to be offensive at all to any person. What I mean is God has provided us with the logical, rational evidence to come to the conclusion there is a God. So if you don't come to that conclusion, it's for some other reason. Generally speaking, what I have seen, it's because there's something else you want more than the truth. And so if that's the case, then the writings of unbelievers are going to contain inconsistencies. And so you can say, if, if he says that things are unjust and unfair here, but then over here he says, no, there's really no such thing as justice and fairness. That's just a cultural construct that's made up. One culture makes theirs up, another culture makes theirs up. Well, then that's just an inconsistency. Right. And so we can say unbelief's inconsistent, but it's much better to say unbelief's inconsistent and Dr. Ehrman is forced to, we can show that by these two different statements Dr. Ehrman has made. Mm -hmm. We asked Dr. Ehrman this question. It'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on the same question. Was there anything tonight that frustrated you? Anything that frustrated me? Maybe. Not necessarily. I, uh, I was very surprised to hear Dr. Ehrman simply admit there are no objective moral values. I had not seen him do that before. In fact, I have seen him say there is something wrong with the world, there is injustice, things are unfair. And when he said, you know what, if a person wants to believe, yes, that's wrong, and another person wants to believe this is wrong, then, hey, I just tell them you should know better somehow. Do you think that was something new he embraced tonight because he was backed into it? That's what it looked like to me. Now, and, and I say that simply because, as, as you could see I've scoured every one of his writings mm -hmm. and I've hardly ever seen him take that position, if ever. I mean, I would, I guess I feel like I would have found that somewhere. Right, right. 
And so I just felt like tonight, he just thought, you know what? Yeah, the, the moral argument does make sense. It, it is logical proof of God. If objective moral values exist, God exists. So instead of denying the moral argument, he simply said, well, objective moral values don't exist. Right. Well, then you can't have justice and unfairness if that's the case. That's right. Absolutely. Dave, did you have any questions on your mind? You've got a lot of well, notes here. Well, following up on that very point, for him to say that, uh, you know, I, I, when I thought about becoming an agnostic, I thought I might lose my moral compass, but I didn't. You know, Flew tried to bring that up. You know, Brother Warren said, you know, why aren't you living a certain way? And he said, oh, I'm married, have two daughters, I'm a moral guy. Well, they, they sidestepped the point. The point is your philosophical position, your, your approach to life demands that you have no moral compass. So the fact that you have chosen to have one is subjective, but that's inconsistent with the position that you've adopted. That's the point that we're trying to make to them. Sure. And you made it well. Kim. Right. And what I, what I, there again, going back to the, was I frustra frustrated by some things. What he just kept saying is we're humans. We know that. Right. And yet in his writings, he said, most humans do nasty things to other people mm -hmm. and say there's nothing wrong with it. Well, if, if humans somehow know this, but he admits all along the way, most humans don't. And then you say, well, can you tell those humans, can you give them a reason not to? And he says, well, I, I just think they should know. Well, that's just not how you can arrive at that. Right. As he said, that's not a very satisfying response. Right. It's just not. It's just not. Did, um, did you have other things that you were wanting to get to tonight, but you just ran out of time? Well, yes. And only one major thing and that's often he says the positions of the different Bible writers are contradictory. Mm -hmm. Well now what I was trying to show with Ecclesiastes was he said Ecclesiastes does not talk about the afterlife. Oh and then in the very conclusion of it it happens to, in the conclusion of chapter 11 it happens to, in several different passages it happens to, but he just said well if I read this passage over here and it says not then I don't have to worry about that passage. Well what I was trying to show was you take anything out of context right. and sure you can make say whatever you want to. What I think is so very interesting, like he says, apocalyptic literature, like in the book of Daniel, he said, uh, that says that evil forces are doing bad things, and it doesn't say that God's punishing people. But do you know when you look in the book of Daniel, who is it that punishes Nebuchadnezzar for the arrogance that he, ha that he has claiming the whole kingdom's his? Well, God is doing that punishment. So what I find it very interesting, you can take the book of Daniel, the apocalyptic literature that he says contradicts Job and those other, and you can find every single instance of God punishing Nebuchadnezzar, the children of Israel being punished, and that's why they're in Babylon, Daniel rising to the top and being elevated because he's being righteous. Every single instance you can find in the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. And so if I had time to really lay that out, I, boy, I sure would have liked to have said, okay, hold on, you just said Daniel contradicts Job, but but what about the end of Daniel mm -hmm. where it says the wise person wins souls because there will be a judgment. As we Every were watching day. backstage, we were experiencing some frustration over his misuse of the book of Ecclesiastes. Right. To continuously quote things which the whole theme of the book is, I tried these and they were wrong, here's the right conclusion. Sure. So I know that was frustrating. And to blame you. it on the redactors. Right, <laughs> right, <laughs> yes. Um, how did you feel you did tonight? Is there anything you'd have done differently looking back? I know I'm putting well, you on the spot. No, no, question. that's a, the, the truth of the matter is, I ask every faithful Christian that I knew basically to pray for. Mm -hmm. I studied as hard as I could for a year on the topic, and I don't know of one other thing that I would change the way I did it. Now, mm -hmm. looking back, do I have some human flaws that probably may come across a little arrogant, mm -hmm. that might look uh, a way I'd rather them not? Yes. But do I think that the truth was presented in a way that God is glorified and everybody can see that the, that the problems or the faults or the, the instances where it wasn't done well was because of myself mm -hmm. and not the truth? Yes. And so, yeah. Well, I thought you did a great job. Well, sure Thank you so, so no. much for uh, letting us be here and for letting oh, yeah. us interview you. Oh, glad to do it. Glad to do it. Great to see you. Proud right of you, my friend. Have a good Appreciate oh, it. Thanks yes, a lot. Well, we are very thankful that we have had the opportunity to talk to these individuals about the uh, debate and how they felt like they did tonight and to discuss some things a little bit further. It has been an exciting night. 
and uh, we are appreciative that you have tuned in to be a part of this. We would like to express our appreciation to the university and their staff for the tremendous assistance that they have given in making this a reality. Especially, we express appreciation to the Christian Student Center for hosting this event tonight. And on behalf of the Gospel Broadcasting Network, I personally want to express gratitude that uh, we have been allowed to carry this and to air this debate tonight to the audience. We want to thank all of those who were physically here and uh, those who have tuned in. The number was very large tonight. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Dave Miller for being here tonight and My participating pleasure. and being the, the brains and the wisdom behind this uh, commentary and discussion. And uh, we're going to wrap up for now. Thank you for being with us and we wish you a good night. This has been a presentation of Apologetics Press, an organization dedicated to the defense of New Testament Christianity. Visit us on the web at apologeticspress.org or call 800-234-8558.